<laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our second panelist discussion with um, uh, Julia Davis, our medical herbalist today, who will be presenting with us, and um, our fe my fellow sickle cell trait warriors, who um, I believe are experts in sickle cell trait because of everything that we experience on a daily basis and throughout our lives. Um, so um, I'll just introduce everyone. We have uh, Pedro and uh, we have Sydney, we have Carl and we have Tremond. Um, and so I don't know if he's able to, I don't know if he's able to join. But anyway, we'll continue. And if he if he joins us, so be it. Um, he may just be a bit late. So we'll get started. Um, I just want to introduce for anyone who may be watching who um, doesn't know the reason for this group, um, Sickle Cell Trait um, Support and Information um, group on Facebook. It was started last year following me going through the worst crisis of my whole entire life. Um, I got so confused and really bewildered and I really didn't know what to do anymore. I'd had enough of being told by doctors that it's impossible or it's extremely rare. And my answers to them were, yes, I know it's rare. However, this is what I go through. Um, and, and guys, please forgive me today. My voice is not very strong because my chest has been really bad and my breathing at the moment um, when talking, I have to take really deep breaths. So please excuse me if ever I kind of get breathless or a bit, um, a bit, a bit funny. I'm, I'm good. Um, I'm just really, really glad to, to be here with you guys. And I think really everybody needs to see the, the times that we go through that aren't as pretty as we want to be seen because it's not always pretty. It's sometimes really ugly. Um, so yeah, um, that's literally um, that's literally it. Um, we started with the first session being last last month, and that went extremely well with um, a, a few other fellow uh, sickle cell trait warriors. And we had um, Dr. Tamia Austin join us and, and do a presentation. So um, that was really extremely extremely positive, really really powerful to be honest, really emotional for me. And, and no doubt today will be extremely emotional as well because I think that's that's my driving passion, especially on days where it's not so great. That drives me, it pushes me that you know that there's, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're speaking out. That's why we're helping to re-educate the masses, the medical world, each other. We're learning so much from each other. And I'm so grateful to you guys because as one person, you guys all know how it feels as just a single person to not be able to spread the word enough and not be able to, you know, let people know enough. I think we, we're always telling people, but then there's always a bit of doubt when doctors say, oh, it's impossible to suffer um, just with carrying the trait then we, we're so often having to defend ourselves. And in the end, I, I got to a place where I just got so tired of having to do that. And I just kept quiet and I just got on with it or I just declined events or, or declined or said I can't turn up uh, to anything that friends had invited me to um, and just decided to just keep quiet. And um, that's not good, that's not healthy. Um, the stress and the trauma um, coming to today's topic, which is um, heavy metal detoxing and, and detoxing and all things herbs, the stress and trauma and the toxin buildup in the body from the trauma and the stress that we hold internally is obviously not good for us as well, because that can also trigger crises and pain. Um, and um, without further ado, I just I, I want to say thank you for joining and I'm going to get straight to it. Um, oh, before I forget, um, thank you to everybody who has purchased my book because it is finally out on Amazon and I will be sharing the link in the chat. I will not forget today. Thank you so much, guys. It's so appreciated. Um, and yeah, if anybody is interested, just put a, put a note in the chat um, and I'll, I'll give you the link. Um, without further ado, I want to hand over to Julia Davis who will be doing our first presentation today. 
um, and Julia is my herbalist. Um, guys, she's fantastic. We met last year um, when my mom actually, I, I was in a state of crisis and my mom had um, really, really critically high hypertension, um, high blood pressure and we were desperate for help. But because of COVID, we weren't sure whether to go to a hospital or not. And I found Julia and um, she reached out and said, I'm able to help. And, and the tonics that she helped my mom and I with really were great. And then as we continued speaking, um, I, I told her what I was going through as a sickle cell carrier. Um, and she has been so supportive and an amazing support to me and my mom. Um, and I guess it's, it's just learning together that both of us, which is fantastic. So I'm proud to have you here today. Um, and <laughs> yep, the, the floor's yours. I will shut up now. I may need some help. Um, so share screen. <laughs> Do I just click share screen? And then um, does that mean everyone can see? Oh, gosh, how do I do this? OK, hold on. Sorry. I'm not the great tech, not the greatest tech person. Hang on. Um, I think this is it. Oh, God, hang on. It's covering my button. <laughs> oh, no. How do I? Oh, sorry. Bear with me, people. <laughs> Can you see that? Is it, yes, yes. Um, is it, is it coming through okay? <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now, how does it, okay. Right. I don't know if these other little things on the side are going to block the writing. Sorry, I didn't think about this bit. <laughs> well, so I wasn't going to, sorry, I've gone a bit, jumped ahead of myself. I wasn't really going to go into the, like the anatomy and physiology and, and the, the causes and the wherefores and why nots and what's happened, how you've acquired it and everything, because you, we all know, <laughs> you, you know how it's come from and you've probably had, you know, just researching yourself about things and what can help. So I don't, I don't want to bore you or, <laughs> you know, or sort of um, go over stuff that you know already, but um so I just thought I'd just dive straight in and sort of go straight to the herbs. Um, um, yeah, it's just, it's just so powerful herbs that you can have. So the, obviously the managing and the preventing symptoms part is, is pretty critical and stress, you know, it's not just emotional, it's um, physical, obviously, um, um, physical and environmental is pretty massive. Um, uh, biological what's going on in your body um, and just just all the types of stress <laughs> um, so nervous system herbs are really pretty cool they are very balancing that's the thing about herbs is that they're very balancing rather than pharmaceutical stuff tends to make things go up or down you know because you might have a high stomach acidity and where herbs will just just balance it out rather than bringing things up or down um, Adrenal glands, obviously very involved in the whole stress response. <laughs> um, adaptogens, I'm going to go through these names in the next slide, but this is just sort of um, just roughly what you kind of want to target when you're trying to manage the symptoms of stress. Um, and adaptogens are pretty amazing things. There's no pharmaceutical product that does, does what that does. <laughs> it basically makes your body adapt to all the stresses of all those stresses that we mentioned like you know phys physical and emotional environmental um and biologic what's going on in your body with, with metabolism um and bark flower remedies are like quite i don't know if anyone has ever used rescue remedy they're pretty underrated um i think and but pretty profound to the extent I've had patients who come back and said, I don't know what you've done to that bottle of herbs, <laughs> but you just only need a few drops. And it's, they really helpful with um, retrospective type of pain as uh, retrospective emotional um, aspect of things. And they kind of help, um, I guess, clear your mind of things and negative sort of character traits that you might see. I'll, I'll have to put a reference on the end for you. Um, and fatigue obviously kind of comes with stress. <laughs> so again, adrenal restorative herbs, adaptogens and liver support, because often 
when you're feeling lethargic and stuff, it's, it's the liver that's really needing, um, it needs a bit of a boost. It does so much in a day, 500 plus jobs. And I think with sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease, I think it's even more under strain because the liver and the spleen, they're the ones that are taking apart all the old and worn and damaged blood vessel, the blood cells. So, um, you know, the liver is, is needing a lot more support, I think, in sickle cell um, traits and disease people because purely it's just under more stress, really. <laughs> and I put this picture of um, the flight or flight, fight or flight response um, just to show, you know, everything is so affected by the stress. It's, um, you know, like so the skin with your blood vessels constricting, that means... You know, we don't really want your blood vessels to constrict because the shape of the cell, the blood cell, is going to, you know, be really not helpful <laughs> at all with, with the constricted vessel. Um, and the other thing as well is, is that blood flow, and when you're stressed, blood flow stops to um, digest. It, it's just not as good to digest the system, immune system, and reproductive system. So if you're stressed, um, those three things are going to suffer majorly. So then the sort of all those symptoms that come along with those three, you know, like the sort of immune system, you kind of want it strong in the case that they might go to some sort of pulmonary episode, <laughs> you know, you don't want to get infected with things. So you want your immune system up. So it all boils down to the stress of, of trying to manage things. And I know like, you know, pain itself is a stressful and chronic pain, you know, and these episodes and crises that come and go is, you know, I can imagine the, almost fear of how pain, when you can start to feel it coming on, and the, the sort of, just the thought of, oh my God, <laughs> this painful thing is gonna happen. That must be very stressful um, to the anticipation of it, I bet, um, you know, is, is gonna cause you a lot of stress. So hopefully we could try and help, <laughs> help with some herbs with all of this. Um, and yeah, just those sort of things, just to show you how, um, how much it really does affect everything and to try and sort of stay, um, do some practices and things, take some things that might just be able to help <laughs> mitigate it because it's it's um, never good. So these are the herbal actions. So nervine, nervine herbs strengthen and nourish your nervous system and they have a very relaxing effect. So they tone the, the um, you know, the sort of nerve fibers and things that, you know, run run from the central, service, the central nervous system to everywhere. Um, adrenal restorative nourish and renew your adrenal glands. And that's like, it's hugely overlooked and medicine is the adrenal glands for so many things um adrenal fatigue is so so common you know and it's um it's pretty much implicated in so many things that the people i see you know um adaptogens they help the body adapt to all those stresses that i was um that's what i mentioned um, um and the antioxidants um that's hugely needed for sickle cell because purely, purely because of the metabolic waste products and build up in your system of um breaking things down um and you know i mean stress itself is going to have the stress hormones um you know pumping around your system <laughs> and they them they can just fire you up so much with um um the the sort of oxidation of things um so the metabolism of um your body produces the stress um chemicals that run you know the hormones but then it also has to break those down obviously because otherwise it's going to be in this pent-up state so then of course your body releases the other things like the endorphins kind of come good but um that whole process means now you've got all these things your body needs to get rid of because you can't just have the hormones floating around like cortisol all the time and then you wouldn't be able to sleeping so it, it releases um other hormones to kind of calm you down when you can can't calm yourself down but you still have to deal with all those metabolize metabolism of those things um which is what the liver has to do <laughs> so um so another thing so the pain you know the, all of these actions can be achieved by herbs i've put a couple of other things there um so the vasodilators um my sort of thought with this is that it kind of at least if it can keep the blood flow going around easier um then you know, that might help reduce it. I mean, anything to reduce the pain. And CBD oil is something that um, I started looking to quite a lot for a few different patients, different reasons. Um, and you can get some that has absolutely zero THC in it as well. 
Um, although some of the studies I was reading actually were saying that some people, they are having medical marijuana to help with their pain, but then of course then you've got the psychoactive signs to it. So the CBD oil could be something that's worth trying. Um, and then PEA, this is one word to say, <laughs> palmitoethanolamide, <laughs> um, PEA for short, that was actually found um, in some studies that they started using it in people with um, neuralgia, chronic fatigue, um, you know, these sort of nervous system and muscular, um, like ME and MS, um, to be actually more effective than things like morphine and those sort of things. So you know, it depends how your body responds to it because everyone's different, but um, that is another, and it hasn't got as many bad side effects as taking say aspirin or paracetamol, um, which kind of not that great for your liver and um, your gut lining. Um, uh, poultices, ginger and chili poultice can be really effective for sort of painful joints and um, perhaps maybe like you're any pain in the um, body, in the torso, or the back. Um, and acupuncture is another thing that came up that um, I'm not sure if anyone's tried um, for to manage pain, um, but that could be something worth doing as well. And then the, the, for the acidosis sort of symptoms that people get, um, I guess this is like preventative, these tips would be sort of more preventative kind of um, health. Um, because you can get pH balancing herbs. So, you know, for stomach, stomach acidity and also just in general, the body overall, just to get it into a sort of a, a nice state, you know, a neutral sort of state. Um, and electrolytes, I don't know if you can get those, um, uh, you know, after you've had a round of diarrhea, you get those sachets of uh, electrolytes, they kind of mix it with water. Those, those would be quite good to kind of just restore all your electrolytes, basically, and that would give you a bit more energy and help balance out the um, sort of acidosis that can happen. Um, although normally I think if you reach the real end point of acidosis, but then I think it's time to go to the, go to the hospital. <laughs> um, so um, infections, obviously that's another, another sort of symptom. Um, so any infection of any body part or, or body system, you know, the herbs are, um, there's some really seriously antibiotic herbs out there. Um, you know, if you didn't want to take antibiotics, because unfortunately you know, with the antibiotics, they do sort of stuff to your, <laughs> they stuff your microbiome around quite a bit. Um, obviously there's a place for them. And, you know, if it's a pretty serious infection, but um, you could have this sort of stuff in the background. So if you have the onset of symptoms, you think, oh, you know, you could take something really strong herbal antibiotics and see how you go for a day and um, take it from there. But um, the nice thing about herbs is that very often they have, they come with so many different um, actions. So it's not just antibiotic, it'll be other complementary actions, complementary to what's actually going on because you know you need something soothing for the mucous membranes so they do that as well anti-inflammatory of course <laughs> um and analgesic so pain relieving and um you get some herbs herbs are very specific to specific body parts it's almost like they were put here for us <laughs> um and it's um quite amazing really you know all all the body systems have a herb that is um affinitive to that particular organ or body system and so you would always throw that in a mix for sure if um like spleen help definitely with sickle cell it needs um a herb called barberry because it's that is the spleen herb <laughs> and um um as you'll see like as we go on in the in the talk i'm going to talk about some other herbs you can use um and gastrointestinal you know i sort of think i i would imagine there's a lot of sickle cell trait carriers that um, may have gastrointestinal gastrointestinal difficulties and symptoms because because of the nature of the way the blood vessels you know if they're not if there's not a proper flow of blood then to the tiny capillaries in in the gastrointestinal lining um, then absorption of nutrients is even affected then you know and it's a, it's just this huge picture <laughs> that needs support on on pretty much for well, every body system from what I can see <laughs> you know it's um, I just don't understand why they don't really recognize. I, I can't get my head around it. And you guys, Rob, you can't get your head around it either. Why they're not really recognizing, you know. Um, you know, it's sort of, for me, I think with the celiac 
and gluten intolerance, um, you know, there's it's varying scales. Like, you know, everyone presents differently and so, someone might have celiac, but someone is gluten intolerant, but they still have tremendous, terrible symptoms of, celi of gluten sensitivity. And surely it stands to reason the same would actually happen if you're carrying a gene where it's going to have some people who don't have hardly anything to almost, you know, not, not presenting, you know, as, as much to someone who's, who's, you know, screaming in pain. It's just, um, anyway. Um, so anemia, um, there's some anti-anemic herbs, which is great. <laughs> there's herbs for everything. <laughs> I may be biased, but there is, there's, there's herbs for everything. Um, and iron supplementation, but this is very, very individual and depends on, um, yeah, it depends on what's going on for you. Um, but iron bisglinate, um, sorry, bisglycinate is as the best form, the most absorbable form. Um, if you can get some of that, if you need iron. Um, but then I've listed some other ones here that like ferrous fumarate and uh, ferrous gluconate and ferrous citrate. Um, because some of those iron tablets that they give you the doctors are really cause constipation is just um, no good. So <laughs> if you can get something like that and um, B vitamins as well, obviously, because that's energy and, you know, needed for iron, uh, red blood cell production. Um, and there's another very interesting thing I was reading. Oh, there's anti-sickling herbs. There's, when I started going down the rabbit hole of this, <laughs> this last week, I, was, I sort of had to stop myself because I thought, oh my God, I've only got 50 minutes. <laughs> How am I going to fit this in? But there's actually some amazing, I've, I've put all the references at the end of this um, presentation and I can, I can email the slides around if you want um or put them up but i'm not sure how we can share them um but there's some really interesting stuff out there that um of herbs that are actually quite anti-cycling you know and just that, that that's awesome it's, there really is herbs for everything <laughs> and um you know not just the sort of um my knowledge of what would be useful for the whole presentation um you know like vasodilators to you know and circulatory stimulant herbs to get the blood pumping around because obviously kind of you need the blood pumping around um but going back to sort of think of how is a blood cell formed it's in the bone marrow so if you can try and get that ethropoiesis um the, the development and the the birth of the stem cells and the blood cells if you can tarnish something there <laughs> that would be where you look and so they've um found that there are certain red blood cells with elevated density and they've got an abnormal membrane so it's almost like they may be clumping together and those cells are they they are what's going to stick to things like the white blood cells so then you sort of think that that's where the immune side is going to go that's why your immune system is not maybe functioning as good sometimes because because the the white blood cells are now compromised because they've got a whole bunch of <laughs> dodgy red blood cells stuck to them um, and then the platelets as well and the blood vessel walls and those are what's causing the painful crisis but they found in these um, studies they did uh, six grams and that's quite a bit of aged garlic extracts and um, four to six grams of vitamin c which actually is quite safe to take in the whole day but you have to work up a tolerance to it otherwise it gives you the runs um, and 800 to 1200 um I use a vitamin E and um, I thought that was pretty cool that those things decreased um, these sort of sticky red blood cells, which um, that's, you know, something to sort of bear in mind to keep taking almost maybe on a daily basis. Um, and there's some other nutrients as well that you can take that will help um, this whole, that whole process, that picture. Um, so, the herbal treatment, what form you take is quite is quite important. Um, herbal teas are so nice and gentle and you know they're effective, but you really should have two or three, ideally three cups a day, um, to have a really good effect. Um, liquid herbal extracts, they're really strong. Um, they're kind of like pharmaceutical grade. I'm pretty sure this is the same in the States and in Canada too, that you may need to see a practitioner for these type of things um, um and it's only because you have to take a full medical history because where they're quite strong you need to know what someone's taking with medication to make sure there's no interactions and ideally you want a full consult with somebody to take a full medical history um you know just to check for other other things going on like you know thyroid or or 
female reproductive is, is quite a big area too and you know just liver support and find out before giving someone liquid herbs because um we could be doing them more damage than than good um tinctures are not as strong but you can often buy those without any prescription you can often get that from um, somewhere you know um and herbal tablets they take longer to work, but not as bad taste as those liquid extracts. They are pretty disgusting in taste, I have to say, but they do the job. Um, and tinctures, I mean, all these things, they, they work. Um, they just, the ones work quicker than the other, really, um, but with no side effects. And of course, topical um, herbs, um, infused oils, um, poultices are really nice. Um, so then the mix of herbs is the most effective, really. Um, and normally in a bottle of, of herbs, there's about five herbs in there. It's just the, they just work together a bit better. Although sometimes that some individuals are really sensitive and if you give them five, it just, it just screws them up, but they just actually need one. And, um, you know, one is um, sometimes all you need really. Um, it's a very, very individualized personal approach because, um, because everyone's so different your biochemistry is different from one person to the next and um yeah so some people need all those five and other ones who just need one um so and the thing is is one herb is many actions so the spleen um that one herb does just fits such a nice picture because you've got a spleen tonic it's a digestive tonic so it's going to improve digestive um, functions and processes so because then if you're improving your digestion, you're going to have more um, absorption of more available nutrients to absorb. Um, and hopefully that might help a little bit with energy levels. Um, Antiprotozoic is like amoeba and uh, sort of um, those type of infections, anti-inflammatory. Um, it's also a liver tonic. Um, antipyretic, that means um, it, re it's, it reduces fevers. Um, liver support, um, so dandelion coffee, dandelion root coffee is, is really, really nice. If you're having too many teas and coffees and you kind of need to cut down on caffeine because caffeine is also are not, not good for your, um, <laughs> for your cortisol levels. Um, you can substitute dandelion coffee. It's so good. And it's, it even looks and smells a bit, um, it's coffee, it's a bit bitter. You can add milk to it or not. Um, and you can eat the leaves and salad, and it's amazingly good for your liver and digestive system. Um, milk thistle, you can take it in a tincture, and that's really nice for the liver. It actually protects other organ cells as well, which is nice. Um, and I think it's really antioxidant, and milk thistle is also lowers um, cholesterol. So that's, and like the triglycerides in the blood. Um, yellow dock. Um, it is a stimulating laxative, but it's also a, a gallbladder tonic, which is often implicated in sickle cell. Um, and you can eat those leaves raw or cooked. <laughs> so, you know, that's another one to add to food. Um, and if you see in the shops, you know, those sort of herbs and you see the teas, you can buy those and the tincture and know that that's going to really work for your liver. Um, so then immune supports. Um, these three are the herbs are listed are really great for um the sickle cell picture you know echinacea i'm sure everyone's sort of all, a lot of you have heard about it um probably a good one to take now with this whole covid around too because it's antiviral um it's a vasodilator too it's um a really great one um you know if you were sort of if you had some echinacea, echinacea tincture at home and you started feeling like you might be um, you know, getting some sort of pulmonary thing going on, you know, you just start taking that. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it just, it's such, it fits the picture so nicely. And withania, um, anti-anemic, you know, that's a big one. And it's actually, withania is um, very blood building. So blood cell building. So um, again, trying to, trying to help or trying to get more normal red blood cells going than, um, the sickle cell shaped ones um, and sort of that sort of thing going um, and it reduces blood pressure um, which I think is probably also quite common with the sickle cell trait even because just by the nature of um, blocked, blocked, um, blocked arteries and veins and um, capillaries um, 
and Andrew Graffis, that's that's a herb that is it's called the king of bitters. It's exceptionally, exceptionally bitter, but the bitter taste is something that um unfortunately now modern day times we all just go for sweet stuff and bitter in days gone by was actually much more mainstream than sugar <laughs> and it was so much better for you um it just does so much so so good um all the way through the digestive tract they've actually found bitter receptors so they know that we should be eating more bitter foods and like those dandelion leaves are quite a bitter taste but um you know, if they're in a salad, you actually wouldn't really notice that bitterness, even things like um, pepper leaves, um, what do you call it in the States? It's um, um, those um, arugula, I think it's called over there. You know, it tastes, even that taste, tastes a sort of bit bitter on its own. So it's just getting our head round that <laughs> we can eat the weeds growing outside. God, don't cut down the dandelion, <laughs> eat it. <laughs> um, and yeah, andrographis is is, um, is also immune system as well. You know, it's just such a um, it's just a shame it tastes so bitter. But you can if you take it in tablet form, they have found the bitter receptors all the way through the gut lining. So um, in the breakdown process, it would still stimulate um, those sort of bitter receptors, and they do a whole heap of things. <laughs> it's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, so cardiovascular, there's three that are really stand out. Um, Anti a that should be antiarrhythmic. So obviously that's like um, just like the drugs you know that you might take antiarrhythmic for a arrhythmias for you know the heartbeat that's a bit out of whack. Um, antioxidants of course. Um, it's a cardiotonic and uh, lowers blood pressure and vasodilator. Um, you can drink hawthorn tea. The berries or the leaves are good and flowers. Um, Motherwort is a nice one because that's actually a nervous system herb as well. So if it's it's used a lot for people who have nervous palpitations. So like you're nervous, it's nothing wrong with your heart. It's just that you're so nervous you've got the palpitations. <laughs> that's a good one to have. And um, the uterus antispasmodic. Um, and then astragalus is another herb that's a cardiotonic um, and a renal tonic because obviously the kidneys are pretty much involved with the cardiovascular system. They kind of, if one of those is something wrong with it, then chances are the other one's also going to have something wrong with it. Um, because they, the kidneys are what set the, help sort of set the blood pressure. Um, so you want a, a renal tonic to kind of keep them in, in shape. Um, and yeah, you know, ideally avoiding soda and things because things like um, carbonated drinks are, not that great for your blood buffers. Um, there's a buffer in your blood that helps keep um, keep the sort of pH level and carbonated drinks are not that great for that and not that great for your kidneys either because um, they muck about with your electrolytes. Um, you know, and your kidneys sort of try and, your kidneys end up having to deal with, you know, more electrolyte loss and you don't really want to lose the electrolytes like, you know, magnesiums and, and calciums and, and phosphorus and these sort of things. Um, because all of that's going to contribute to that acidosis and, you know, want to keep pH balance. Um, so, um, so pulmonary, you know, the support for your lungs. Um, ribwort is a great herb and it interacts with hardly anything because <laughs> of course perhaps you know with all of these herbs i'm talking about it might be good to just double check that nothing interacts with if you're on any medications um but ribwort is one that hardly interacts with anything and it's it's just so great for the lungs because <laughs> it's a, what's called a mucous membrane tonic and a mucous membrane tonic is um kind of says what it does on the tin it's um it just tonifies and helps build up and nourish um the lining of your lungs um, and the lungs um, and also also the gastrointestinal to some extent but more, more like the lungs it's more affinity for um, and it's um, it's very soothing as well because often you just need a good your hugs you, you need to give your lungs a bit of a hug <laughs> with the herbs um, euphorbia um, I can spell that right but euphorbia is a herb that is a bronchodilator a relaxing expectorant because sometimes those when you get a cough and it's um 
it's a strong cough. It can give you aches just from coughing. So you kind of want a sort of relaxing expectorant. It's not going to be as harsh, you know, um, coughing and retching because um, that in itself is very debilitating too. Um, so astringent herbs, it's astringent, astringency means um, very drying out, like um, um, an apple is quite astringent and that drying sensation um, but you kind of want that to dry out your mucus, mucus if there's buildup of mucus on your lungs. Um, and um, antispasmodic just means that it relieves um, spasms, you know. Um, um, so marlin is another herb that grows around quite a bit. It's very nutritious and emollient is like very, um, well, emollient for your skin, if you can imagine that sort of nice, um, it's like a mucilage, almost like a, a um, very gelatinous type of stuff in its leaves and that is so nice for the mucous membrane linings it's really really great um, and it's wound healing as well so if there's any breaks in the lining of your lungs um, you know it's going to really help with that um, so onto the reproductive system shepherd's purse this is another a lot of these things are just growing on the i don't know about where in america in fact i think there are some places in america that these things just grow <laughs> um just they class as weeds you know and they're so good for you. <laughs> so shepherd's purse is um is a systemic and a uterine anti-hemorrhagic and it just grows by the wayside and it's a urinary antiseptic too i mean obviously they're cultivated for you know if we want to take them but um they really are very good and underrated uh yarrow is another one that's for anti-hemorrhagic because um you know i can imagine most sickle cell females have got probably quite um a lot to deal with every month <laughs> And um, sure, the anti-hemorrhagic can really help um, stop the sort of flow that might be um, quite persistent um, at times. And astringency, again, to try and dry things out, um, you know. Ladies' mantle, I think it's the lady's friend, that one. <laughs> Menstrual cycle regulator and um, a nervous system again. And um, uh, balances things out a bit in terms of... Um, History berry is... Um, a great herb for um, it must be for before you get reach menopause that herb is not for after um, um, so that regulates periods and it's progesterogenic so if estrogen is a bit low you can increase the progesterone by taking that that's a really nice one to take um, unfortunately you know the reproductive system herbs they do take a little while to, to sort of have an effect um, mainly because you've only really got once a month to see what its effect it's had. <laughs> so you've got to wait another whole month to see of taking it to see is it, you know, is it working? Um, but they do reset the sort of um, HPO regulator is a hypothalamic pituitary ovarian <laughs> because um, of that's the way it works really. You know, your brain um, glands tell the next sort of um, the hypothalamus um, tells the pituitary which tells the ovaries to release the hormones, which, you know, has the whole cycle set in place. And so if, um, when you're stressed, though, <laughs> the, um, the hypothalamus is going to sense that. And so that's how things are going to start to go out of whack, you know, and, um, um, yeah, another reason why stress is no good. <laughs> um, digestive system. Um, these ones are really easy to get hold of, of course, you know, chamomile, peppermint, um, lemon balm, dandelion. There's quite a few herbs for your digestive system and um, globe artichoke and ginger. At least, you know, globe artichoke, you can actually eat as well um, as take a, a tincture or so. So you could have that in your food and um, um, you can make some really nice chamomile cookies. <laughs> chamomile and lavender, actually, that's a really nice um, way of getting them into you to calming the nervous system and lemon balm is also actually a um nervous system support so and antiviral <laughs> so as you can see like all these herbs have got so many other different things that they do um i think they get mainly touted for one thing but actually there's um so many other things that they do um that make them good for the sort of picture of what's going on for sickle cell um, um 
And then, you know, the joints in the osteo, your joint pains and this sort of thing. Um, the main thing I think there is actually vasodilation because if you can get the blood flow to that area, it's going to warm it up and it's going to take away um, the sort of toxins and bring nutrients and oxygen to that area. And normally that's what you kind of, you know, even things like massage, that's what it's, you know, that's what it's all about with the joints. And if you can get the blood flow going there, um, that's going to help quite a, tremendously, really. Um, so the emotional, adrenal, and nervous system herbs, a couple of examples here. Um, Romania is one of two. The other one's licorice. Um, they're adrenal herbs. The only reason I didn't put licorice, even though it tastes, it's one of the very few herbs that taste nice, um, is that often it um, makes you urinate out um, potassium. So that's why it's, you can't take licorice if you've got high blood pressure. Um, um, so Romania is like sort of the next one you'd go to for adrenal restoration sort of thing. Um, and it's also anti-hemorrhagic. So I thought this is probably better than licorice. Um, and shizandra, that is shizandra berries are used. It actually doesn't taste too bad as a herb. Um, it's a nervous system tonic and a liver support. Mild antidepressant is an awesome herb. Um, antioxidant and adaptogen, so it helps you adapt to stresses and things. That herb was actually used by the Russian soldiers in the war to give them stamina because it's really great for mental performance and um, for fatigue and things like that. So it's a really good one to um, kind of keep going and endurance. <laughs> you need to keep going. Um, got your cola. That's called, um, in other words, this nature's Botox. <laughs> and that herb is um, has actually also been shown to reduce um, keloid scarring in trials, which... Um, that's pretty cool that it can reverse scars, you know? And so it's because it's connective tissue regenerator and it's um, it's awesome for veins, um, for venous support. Um, you know, again, it's gonna help the, help the blood vessel walls um, and antifibrotic. So I think that's, that's a really good one for the sort of whole picture of what's going on there. And, um, and of course, Bach flower remedies, <laughs> I hope they mentioned it earlier, they are just so, um under underrated in my opinion but um i mean some people don't have any reaction to it at all and other ones you other people you know you just put it in and they are so much better and have um you know just a different outlook because it's 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 all going on up here is, is where everything else is dictated as you probably all know this is mixing up the herbs so you have a I just thought I'd show this just to show you what it's like because it's hard for people to understand sometimes, but it's um this is the liquid extracts and you have um all the different herbs, obviously, and you just um you get different min and max. Oh, I hope I'm not gonna die here. I just have to plug myself in. <laughs> um you have different um levels of a therapeutic dose. Sorry, I just have to plug myself in a moment. Get die my battery might die um so you get different levels of how much herb to add in um some herbs have a very low therapeutic index meaning you don't need much of it and the other ones you know you've got loads that other one i mentioned romania is it takes up quite a bit of the bottle but it's um it's a really good one to include um and um yeah so you kind of mix them all up and it normally is about four or five herbs, sometimes three. It depends. It depends what's what herb you use, of course. Um, dietary, I found, you know, <clears throat> obviously, you know, <clears throat> a lot of you might know about the vitamin C when you're eating iron to absorb things, um, but also zinc because iron and zinc actually compete for um, absorption, and so my sort of thoughts are that you know zinc. It's a very similar shaped molecule to iron. <laughs> and thus, I'm thinking with sickle cell that I think there is actually some sort of, um, you know, if um, iron is it might be a bit of an issue, then I think zinc is as well because it's purely a sort of shaped molecule that it is. And then they compete for absorption. So um, I just thought I'd list some of these type of um, dietary things that you could um, try like grain free because it's a risk factor to zinc deficiency and um 
it, it, zinc deficiency is actually quite common for everybody, it seems. The most, so many people I see, it seems to be um, zinc is um, not really been, um, been taken or been knocked out by heavy metals. Um, eat the rainbow every day. I'm always trying to tell people it doesn't even matter. There's been recent research that showed it doesn't even matter <clears throat> the quantities <clears throat> of what you eat. You don't have to eat all of those. <laughs> if, the, if you're even having a small little grab of um, some grated carrot and you've had your yellow, uh, orange, you know, you just the small amounts of it all, as much color as you can every day in your diet, it's just, it'll do so much for your bacteria. Um, and I found actually <clears throat> there's some foods that showed some anti-sectoring effects. Um, it's a really interesting paper. I put the link in the um, in the um, references at the bottom of um, these things that um, the Senegal prickly ash and um, the West African pepper, the sorghum, which I was really pleased to the, with to hear, and clove um, and pawpaw are things that actually have anti-sectoring effects in vitro. And I thought that was pretty cool to include those in your diet to just I mean all we can try and do is prevent things you know um and antioxidants um and pain relieving constituents and things as capsaicin which is in chilies and black pepper eugenol is another sort of uh, analgesic type of effect um clove buds that's why people chew chew those when they've got the <laughs> sore um the painful tooth um, and all of these things, and even vanilla pods, which I thought was really nice because I quite like <laughs> vanilla pods myself. Um, turmeric, pepper, ginger, and all of these things, if you can include those in as much in your diet as possible. Um, more, this is more of a preventative type of thing, you know, because prevention is way better than cure. <laughs> um, and nutrients, this was B2. Um, L-glutamine, sorry, that, that's um, for reducing adhesion. Um, 30 grams daily, though, it's really hard to try and find a supplement with that much, that much glutamine in. Um, it actually improves the adhesion of the red blood cells. So this is something to take maybe on a, a daily basis, possibly. Um, and it's really great for your gut lining because taking painkillers, obviously you have to kill the pain, um, maybe it to offset what damage it does to the gut lining like these um aspirin and paracetamol is to take glutamine as well just so that you get some sort of level of protection in your gut lining because it's going to start affecting your gut microbes and and then the microbes get affected and there's all sorts of other things that get affected <laughs> this could be a lot longer than 50 minutes <laughs> um anyway so um same as vitamin b2 they noticed that there was only a very small study though um, five milligrams twice a day for eight weeks. The only thing if you take vitamin B2 is your urine is going to be bright yellow. <laughs> so don't be alarmed. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> it's just a side effect. Um, and that's that's something too. Um, and again, the CBD oil and that PEA I mentioned earlier, they, they reduce pain and swelling. Um, tissue salts, I don't know what it's called. I think it's actually called Martin and Pleasance in the States. They do Martin and Pleasance um, uh, do tissue salts it's called and what's nice about them is you can crunch them up in your mouth perhaps when you're even having a crisis um, I've recommended that to people with um, a period pain there's certain ones that you can take um, and on an acute sort of dosage when you're going through something and you can just crunch them and you can absorb it obviously in through your uh, under the tongue so that's why they're quite nice because they kind of get and they're very available form like phosphate forms of things um, and electrolytes, and there's something in this country called Basica. I don't know if it's going to be in the States or Canada or um, wherever else, um, but that's got some really nice, um, again, nice forms of those electrolytes. Um, and antioxidants are huge to take, um, vitamin A, C, and E, um, and of course, iron. Um, I'm conscious you'll be running out of time. Oh, right. So the so omega oils, they're good to take for the anti-inflammatory. Um, and if you've got dry skin or any dermatitis type of things, then definitely get something that has got um, not just omega-3, but also omega-6, um, maybe 7 if they've got it, and 9. Because those 6 and 9 are, um, are also for your skin. So like I know the dermatitis, um, you know, probably with um, reduced blood flow and things to your skin might make it dry. So omega 
three, six, and nine is the one to get. Um, folate, lysine, and betaine. So this is one of my things where I went off on a bit of a tangent when I was researching stuff. And I've put the I've put all these links at the end and the references to go and have a look because there's some really interesting things. Um, you know, because DNA methylation, so methylation is when your body um, has a, what's called a methyl group. And these particular, it's, and it's to basically help, um, it's involved in lots of different things. Methyl methylation, um, like, I mean, that's a whole other topic as well, but um, it's another chemical reaction is going on in your body that um, um, is often very, yeah, it's, it's impacted by your, um, your DNA, um, DNA methylation and the methylation of um, toxins, nutrients. Um, so these three um, methyl donors, folate, glycine and betaine, and you can take those in um, supplements form and they increase the methylation to alter the gene expression because I sort of thought, is there a way that we can somehow fiddle with this gene expression of sickle cell trait <laughs> to try and make it not not present so much and not not have these crises and things so much you know to try and the pain must be the worst one i think you know um so i was thinking is there some way we can try and change this <laughs> this is the only process i got to it um and magnesium and zinc are also involved in um in messenger rna not mrna like the covid vaccine but you get something in your cells messenger rna and that goes and ferries off um the the genetic material and magnesium and zinc are actually also involved in that whole um, kind of breakdown of RNA. So I sort of thought, well, if you're taking these, well, and also oh, look, they've got their own benefits beside the sort of um, genetic side of things. Um, you know, it's probably useful to take these as well. Um, I know you'll be too popping loads of things and magnesium powders and <laughs> be like a little pharmacy, a little health shop in your home. Um, so magnesium also relaxes your muscles. This one is pretty big. It could even um, help with um, treating high blood pressure to take high dose magnesium. The only thing is it can, you've got to build it up a bit slowly because you don't want to, um, if you have too much magnesium, it also makes, gives a bit of diarrhea going on. Um, um, and also it helps with these, those dense red blood cells and improves the um, membrane transport. So kind of anything to help support your blood cells, I think is, um, is going to be huge. <laughs> and of course the B complex um, for energy. Um, toxins, I mean, this is, this is also another whole thing. This book here is completely changed. <laughs> Staying alive, I don't know if that's backwards for you, Stay, just realize staying alive in toxic times and it's a seasonal guide to lifelong health and it does, it's like a manual really of, of um, what to do to stay healthy and I think it's, um, it's hugely, um, I would hugely recommend it um, because it's, it's written by a doctor actually and she was very disillusioned with why her patients weren't really getting better and you know why are we seeing so much cancer and diabetes and all the rest of it and you know um and she sort of went and looked into things and it's it's all about you know we're surrounded by toxins and heavy metals we breathe it in we um it's on your mattress when you sleep on your mattress because there's flame retardants that's like the bromine um the chlorine in the tap water the fluorine fluoride and they mess with your iodine which then messes with your thyroid <laughs> and you know the thyroid sets your metabolism and it's involved in your heart your um, heart rate and so many things um and pushes out basically all these things these toxins push out our nutrients and um when you really in a if you have have a condition you know that you're predisposed to you kind of don't really want all this stuff pushing out your nutrients because you need your nutrients to help support your condition um and um you know all nutrients need to be in balance as well and um it's one of the scary things she actually was saying about is that so we all have um, most of us probably all have stainless steel cookware and you might be cooking as tomato-based sauce and in stainless steel, there is nickel and tomato is very acidic and it, um, 
causes the nickel to leach out into your food. And then you, of course, you're eating nickel and then instead it's pushing out the zinc. So, you know, it's this whole um, web of stuff that we're exposed to and that we're eating and drinking. And I mean, the best you can do is mitigating it is to maybe switch switch your pots and pans to something like it's either glass, ceramics or um, cast iron. And of course, maybe you're getting some iron in your food if you use cast iron. <laughs> um, um, yeah, the only thing to remember is that um, iron and zinc compete for absorption. So don't ever take them together and don't take them with calcium because that stops them being absorbed. Um, and um, copper toxicity is something as well that actually is that's um, something that often with a lot of PMS sufferers, if you ever had taken oral contraceptive pill or the IUD, the um, copper coil intrauterine device, those things, um, they really knock out um, the zinc. And so you become sort of a bit more zinc deficient because there's more copper than there is zinc. And, um, you know, zinc has a very relaxing effect on the nervous system as well. So if you've got too much co copper toxicity, you end up being a fired up nervous system and that's the last thing you need. <laughs> um, and yeah, calcium and magnesium, we well, need more, cal more magnesium than calcium. Um, you know, they always say to take calcium for your bones, but this is a bit of a myth. <laughs> and it's it's so annoying. It's like just perpetuated all the time. You know, if, if you want foot health for your bones, take vitamin D3 and K2, because that will help you absorb. There's so much calcium in the food anyway that we're eating. You don't really actually need too much more. Um, magnesium is the one because it's so much more relaxing and um, on just so many levels. It's involved in the energy cycle of, of energy that your body produces every day. Um, you know, magnesium is needed for so many more things than calcium really. Um, and you can always do a hair tissue mineral analysis test, which shows your nutrient levels and also your heavy metal toxin like load. Um, and then you can start taking things like vitamin C and vitamin E and vitamin A. They're really great to get rid of toxins because those, those things are, are just going to clog up your system and, and clog up your liver. And, you know, I think, like we said in the beginning, you know, liver is liver support is huge for sickle cell sufferers because, because of the extra work it's got to do. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of blood cells in, right in your body, <laughs> you know, and so just think of every one of those and how many are not um, maybe misshapen or not, you know, and also just the support that you need of carrying oxygen around. Um, yeah, so that's that. And now um, something I thought of is that when you start to feel the early stages of a crisis starting, like, you know, aching, inflamed joints sort of thing, that is the time to start hammering the vitamin C. <laughs> and you can quite safely take two grams, you know, and maybe then one time, and then you could even take, say, six grams in a day. So like to stagger it, so like two grams, and then like, you know, maybe... See how you go with two grams late in the day. Like, you know, if, you, if you're running to the toilet all the time, you know, that's your threshold. <laughs> but you could take it in stages of, of maybe one gram if you're worried about that. Um, but, and, and it's vitamin E as well. Um, but, oh, yes, I thought that you can, you can counteract the sort of runs with the psyllium husk because, it, you know, that might just hold the stool in transit a little bit longer if you want to take more vitamin C. Um, and vitamin E, I've sort of, also found out recently this vitamin E, you know, there's eight forms of it and you ideally want to take all eight forms <laughs> to have a really good effect. Um, something as well, aspirin is probably better to take for sickle cell than paracetamol for the pain, only because um, paracetamol reduces glutathione, which is needed to detoxify. And, um, you know, again, liver support really, that's what that's for. Paracetamol is probably worse for your liver Aspirin is not so great for your stomach lining, but I think the lesser of two evils might be the aspirin to some extent. Depends on what you've got going on. And if you are on medications, maybe let's say no aspirin, um, then you could just take maybe extra liver support if you take paracetamol. Um, um, yeah, ginger tea and a poultice for aches and pains is really good. And Epsom salt baths. Um, magnesium is really best absorbed also through your skin and you know it's so nice and relaxing to have a magnesium epsom salt bath um and you can also get magnesium oil um or creams to put on so you're still absorbing quite a bit of um, magnesium 
and then mental and well-being practices, um, guided meditation. Um, yeah, I, I just sort of listed out a few other things that you could do. <laughs> I don't know. You probably do all these things already. Um, and then, yeah, acupuncture, massage, um, a flotation tank can be nice unless you're a bit uh, claustrophobic, um, counselling, and um, the other two are things you can look up if they're in your country. And then here's all these, um, um, yeah, all the references of things that I would highly recommend some of those because they're really um, very interesting. <laughs> um, and that's it. I think I've gone over the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> I should probably check. Yes, that's, sorry. You're um, perfect. You're on stop? time. What do I do now? <laughs> Press stop share? Uh, it... Yes. Okay. Hello. That was really, really <laughs> oh, informative. No. I feel like I just downloaded all the stuff. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really useful because oh, there was sorry. so much that, that I was sorry. taking in. That was, <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. There's so much that we, I think um, in the sh in the chat, a few people had been kind of like posting. So I was watching and keeping up and I was oh. thinking, oh, wow, there was there was so much info that would it be, um, I think you mentioned it's okay to email the slides across because I think. Yeah, how do I make it public or put it somewhere? <laughs> um, we'll email it over to me and then I can share it with the group and, and that will be really yeah, helpful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then at least, at least I can share it in the group. Um, yeah. on Facebook and, and yeah. then to all our panelists because that would be okay. really great oh, that would be I good. think I think you know when you kind of listening but you want to really absorb I've got my notepad here so I was writing as much as I could and I thought well let Three. me let me ask if it's okay we can that was really really helpful thank oh, you oh good oh good I'm really pleased because I was thinking yeah. oh, no, how much you know everyone probably might know all this stuff already and just you're thinking boring <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's great because I mean I I didn't know the things that can help with like um cycles. You you guys, it's it's no secret and and my book literally kind of goes in a bit more detail. Um, but my my cycles have been really messed up. Every time I have a crisis, it messes with my cycle as well. Um, or every time I have a period, it can trigger cycle uh, crisis pains for me um so and then heavy bleeding and clotting so for me that was really helpful and then also with the um breathing I think when you send the slides over I'm gonna have a look at um some more of the herbs and maybe discuss with you um other stuff that can help my breathing because yeah breathless just talking <laughs> but yeah um so guys um I, I know that Julia you had mentioned that you might have to um finish have to pop out a bit earlier because I kind of again my brain fog forgive me guys I literally um having to take every day a step at a time and the jinko that I've that Julia mixed for me and some tonics have been helping but I nearly burnt the house down the other day because I just was so absent-minded um I left the grill on um and just stupid things like that are not normal for me I'm very alert normally um, but since being in hospital, it's gotten worse um, in, in December. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just be taking each day as it comes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I wanted to open the floor up to questions for 15, we'll say about 15 minutes. And then at the end, um, then, then anybody who has any questions, feel free to um, Bob them in the q and I'll keep an eye on that. There's none in there at the moment. There's one, Julia, that I think I sent to you right now. Um, okay. What is in the chat? I think it? it's in the chat, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, somebody from the group had a question yesterday and I just wondered if you're able to, um, because she was, uh, I think for iron overload, especially with sickle cell anemia, I know that we have to be conscious of like which iron supplements are safe to take and what dosages. Um, oh, yes. So she asked about. Um, was that? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Do I go? Hang on. It should be at the bottom of your screen if you click on the chat icon, and then you'll be able to see that. And then I've I've got a couple of things that I I think I wanted to ask. Oh, as Q and A. Well. Sorry. Oh goodness. Sorry. Open the Q and A. No answer. The chat. No, no, sorry, I think I sent you a direct message. Um, and then you guys also feel free to ask Julia any questions too. 
um, mm -hmm. Carl and Sydney, please definitely. And Pedro, feel free to ask. Um, I'll shut up. <laughs> Hang on. So at the bottom of chat, uh, has it that, come up? Um, wait a minute. Um, it seems to be saying a direct message to you or... Um, I'll tell you what, let me go back to it. Mm -hmm. So I had, um, I think I sent it. Okay, so I can read it out if that's, if that's better. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, no, it's okay. Um, so someone had asked yesterday um, whether we can safely supplement iron, iron for um, sickle cell anemia children due to iron overload as the body doesn't process it properly. Um, so she asked if heme iron would be best and if there's a proper dosage weight reference that, that you could kind mm. of. I suppose it would be good to know. Um, um, I guess knowing the iron levels of the person. The yeah. First. Yeah. And um, don't ever be fobbed off when they just say, yeah, this is your iron because you don't, you need the whole picture, of course, you know, like um, not just iron levels. And you know you get the um, transferrin as well, mm -hmm. and um, or, you know all that breakdown of all the little bits and pieces, not just you know red blood cell, white blood cell, hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, heme iron. I mean, I guess is it worth maybe if there is an iron overload, mm -hmm. is it worth maybe just eating the iron as it were? E you know, from not actually supplementing, but making sure the there's. Duck vitamin C and yeah, and eating leafy uh, greens that would they, the, the dark leafy greens and yeah, uh, yeah. I would think maybe just to, on a, a gentler approach, if it's supposed to, if it's a child, how mm -hmm. old is the child? So we don't know. <laughs> okay. I, I haven't got the age that's of the okay. child. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, Cause that's a very fine line with children as well. If, you know, depending on the age of how much iron you can give a child, mm -hmm. you know, you probably see even on, on um on most iron supplements it will it's for children they'll be saying you know do not exceed this dose and there's a reason because they just because children don't excrete iron the way adults do you know it just goes it just passes through our feces if we've had too much or normally mm -hmm. um but if there's iron overload already then um maybe just a gentle sort of approach to taking the sort of heme iron um you know through foods through might be a bit better or safer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Um, okay, so Pedro sent another question. Um, oh, yes. So I'm wondering, would you like to answer this one live? If you, yeah, can, you sure. see the, can you see the Q&A at the bottom? You know, so, oh, I've seen it's popped up, yes. Yeah. Has there been um, any trade sickle cell trait and, and asthma? Yeah, I think it's asthma. He has okay. both. Um, okay. Should we answer this one live? Yeah, I can yeah. if you like. I don't know yeah. that there has been correlations, but I can imagine that it's. Um, I mean, it depends if. have you? How long has it been there, I wonder? Because um, I don't know if there's any, been any correlations between. Um, Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have thought it's. Um, I, mean, I don't know if it's actually correlated. Um, I can't imagine sickle cells going to help asthma if you have mm. asthma. Um, I don't know that there is any correlations. I'm afraid. Um, I suppose you can just use a lot of supportive, um, you know, lung herbs and things. Um, Nettle, actually, do you know what nettle would be a really great one for you? Because nettle is um, anti-allergy and it's very, um, and uh, blood, it's good for blood because it's quite nutritious. And um, I'm taking nettle and beetroot um, as a tea. Yeah. They're not as bad as they sound, <laughs> the blood blood um, <laughs> properties, yeah. And um, yeah, but um, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure there is a correlation um, I would think it makes, uh, or I guess it 
if if you're having crises and and it's affecting your breathing it might trigger off asthma symptoms so yeah it, and it depends i guess what's um, vice versa. what trigger your asthma if you're an allergic to something or if it's mm. um, you know what sort of yeah what the cause of the asthma is mm -hmm. um yeah certainly as you say it could be a trigger and of course the stress of a crisis coming could trigger the asthma um and making more prone make you more prone to being kind of asthmatic sort of thing um or those type of episodes of crop you know the asthma <laughs> not breathing properly and um yeah um Pedro says he'll try him him and his mom um have both so they'll oh. try they'll try that thank yeah. you I think Sydney has um a question that she'd like to ask you so um yeah go ahead Sydney and Carl feel free to unmute and jump in after <laughs> I have a question I'll wait though <laughs> okay oh I can't hear you <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> awesome. Um, I have a question. Um, and if you're able to answer, I know you talked a lot about abdominal issues with people who suffer from sickle cell in the trait. Um, and I was wondering if there is anything out there that people can take um, to help increase their appetite when they are in those crises or having those pains that causes them to not eat. Um, like on a regular, like sometimes I can go a day without eating or I'll just eat something small or have to do a smoothie. And then some days I'm like eating like a normal person. Okay. Okay. You know, um, I'm just thinking, you know, what might help is, um, do you like ginger? Or yes. No, so, so maybe, <laughs> um, cause ginger is really, um, I mean, ginger is, um, anti-emetic so it, you know like you know like if you have nausea feelings um and it's a carminative herb which means it helps relieve um trapped wind and um ginger tea might be something it's a metabolic stimulant as well so it might be that it um could help sort of stimulate that whole um process and you know those bitter herbs <laughs> that i mentioned um they actually, that bitterness actually sort of helps get your digestive juices going. And you're, once you're, um, once they start going, um, you kind of would sort of want to eat a bit more. Um, I suppose you're, you, do you mean sort of before you've got to that eating stage though, you just, you, um, you don't really want to eat or you have no desire to eat? Kind of both. And then like the body doesn't want to take it in anymore. It's kind of like, a, just like a rejection. It's, it's just no appetite. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. There is a herb that does um, stimulate your appetite. It's called um, Zizifus. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you or, spell that? Or Spiny oh, Jujube, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> that's a great name. Will um, you email that across if that's okay? Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. It's an awesome herb. And like it's a nervous system tonic. It's um, a muscle relaxant. It's a digestive system herb. Uh, it increases your appetite. Um, it's helpful for people who've um, lost weight through being ill, you know, because that's what happens. And it just helps them um, neutrify. And it's a very good herb for ton a tonifying, um, yeah, your gut and your nervous system and everything. Um, okay, I'll send you some, and it's, um, it's one of the not so badly tasting herbs, because <laughs> they're all pretty gross, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not touting them pretty good here, am I, but they're, you know, they are, um, they, they just work really um, so well, underestimated, um, but Sisyphus is one, I'm just trying to think, there's another one that's, um, Funny enough, prickly ash is a metabolic stimulant. I don't know. And and the, what came up in my research was Senegal prickly ash is anti-sickling. And prickly ash that we were trained in is um, obviously from the same family because it's got the same first Latin name. Because when I first saw it, I thought, oh, my goodness, like, you know, <laughs> I, I could get this one. But I said, I can't get the Senegal prickly ash, but the prickly ash that I can get is... Um, a stimulant for metabolism so you know that's 
um, and a few other things as well, but that's another good one um, to take, a circulatory stimulant as well. So, you know, again, maybe that's that's good for the whole picture. Um, what about what about if you used um, aromatherapy? Like if you smelt some essential oils that actually made you think, oh, I could eat something, you know, or that okay. maybe some work? Um, I can try that. Um, I'm not sure what would do that. <laughs> I'm not an aromatherapist, but it's just sort of come to my head. So if you, you know, because like the whole sensation of wanting to eat and something that makes your mouth water and then you want to eat something, it's often like your sense of smell. And I'm just thinking, is there something that, um, like when you smell, when you get into that sort of state, when you smell food, do you want to eat it or you just think outright, no? <laughs> I want to eat it. And then you take a couple <laughs> bites and then your stomach's oh. like, well, that's it. I'm full. Oh, okay, I see. For me, it's the other way around where it's like, yeah. I'm in crisis and the pain and because most of the time I end up having fevers as well with them. And with the joint swelling, I just, the pain is just too much that I can't even think about food. It's like it completely disappears. So I don't even, I think even the smell of food, I'm not really, my, my mom last year had to feed me um, during some of the time I was, I was really bad. Um, and thankfully this year, my appetite's been okay. But if, if I don't eat, um, what I do is just hydrate. I've got, uh, I tend to drink like five, five liters. This recently I've been drinking about five liters a day of water. And if I can't eat, just hydrate. That's, that's my method. And, and I have my ginger and lemon here. <laughs> That, that helps it, it does help so yeah. for jumping in can I just quickly ask there was um Zizifus, I, I've put it in the chat just so that everyone can see what you mentioned and then Senegal mm. the ash and you mentioned one between that and I've forgotten what it was um Julia I think it was the Bricklia uh, um uh Zizifus, um I can't remember the other one the ginger tea, the bitter herbs, she was saying. Yeah. yeah, which one was the, was there a name that you mentioned, the bitter herbs? Um, there's a few. Dandy okay. like a good one because, you know, I think everyone can get their hands on that. Okay. Um, and um, milk thistle oh, yeah, was for another the liver. one for the liver. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking if there was, um, you know, if there was something that you could... Um, could do to sort of stimulate your 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 taste buds for more food. I would think Sisyphus would be a good one to try. Actually, okay. you know as well um, is Echinacea, which is the one for like you know immune and um, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. That actually also stimulates um, stimulates the production of saliva. But you know saliva is an enzyme that that's where the digestion of your food starts is in your mouth so you know obviously you chew it and the saliva mixes with the food it starts um dissolving and working on the food already mm -hmm. so stimulating echinacea is another one and it actually has a when you put the drops in your tongue it's it tingles so again don't be alarmed this is normal um and, and not a reaction <laughs> it's uh, um the tincture that might actually help um because i'm just thinking if we can stimulate your um saliva production that would probably naturally make you want to keep chewing maybe um it might sort of set the other ones in motion the other you know the pancreas to release stuff and the liver to release and the you know all the things that get released for digestion of food um it would all start with the saliva and the food in the mouth so maybe that might be something else to take actually as echinacea um, okay yeah <laughs> and i think you can get that as a tincture quite easily in a health shop or something i don't know okay. where you're based <laughs> Um, yes thank you that's okay <laughs> um carl have you got any questions yeah, did you say yes uh, thank you so much julia for this information oh, that's okay carl wow. I'm blown away. Uh, some things i've been doing um but learned a lot of new things i have a question just on clarification you mentioned green tea extract um does that that that's a, a supplement as opposed to green tea drink drinking green tea Yes, that's correct. It would be um, in a supplement, yeah, a tablet form. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because I think it's worth, to, I mean, I, I'm not sure the dosage you'd have to take of that. Um, okay. 
um, I know like sort of, you know, um, perhaps it doesn't have as much um, um, caffeine in there, you know, as as a drinking a cup of tea or, <laughs> okay. um, or coffee. You know, if you're worried about the sort of caffeine intake. <laughs> no, lucky for my wife has a health and wellness business with organic supplements, wow. a lot of which you mentioned as yeah. health, you know, vitamin E and C and uh, with doing those kinds of things. But I, I think I have to ask her now if we have that. She has that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, um can I just ask Julia, you yeah. know, if we wanted to do like a heavy metal detox, how would we sort of prep the body beforehand um, to kind of absorb um, the best nutrients from our yeah. foods and from the supplements that we take in because yeah. of the, the, I guess, the toxins around us? You know, what the best thing would, um, is to make sure that you've got um so nutrify yourself first before you try and do a detox because you need the nutrients to um to actually to detox in the first place this is why it ends up being you know all these deficiencies and stuff end up carrying on because because we're already surrounded by all this um all the you know chemicals and whatnot and um and if you're already in a state where your body is sort of lacking nutrients um it's going to be a lot much harder to much much harder for your body to try and get rid of um you know all this all the toxins but so you actually need to take in the nutrients first something as well i've been put onto recently more so is liquid um liquid nutrients and over here there's a range called biocare they do liquid nutrients because of course if it's liquid your body can absorb it so much quicker and they tend to have a lot less um a lot less additives and you know than bulking agents and all this that they would normally put in uh, tablets and um yeah so taking sort of liquid supplements is good because you can absorb that first. so you kind of have to actually do a big <laughs> a big hit of nutrients first and then go through the detox phase i mean you can detox really heavy with something called um toxoprevent and oh my god that gives you flu-like symptoms and all sorts of things you know it depends how heavy you want to go with this but um you can actually, um, you can do that, or you can try the gentle sort of approach with teas, um, because that talks to prevent stuff. It's something called uh, uh, cliptonite or cleoptonite, or cleoptile. It's a really funny word, but it comes from volcanic, um, volcanic soil, and it helps sort of um, bind the heavy metals for excretion through the um, digestive tract. Um, but it sort of dislodges some things that might have been lodged in your, you know, your organs, or your brain. So, I mean, it's good to take in some ways, but, you know, um, it's very sensitive people that can actually stir up. It can even stir up emotional stuff that you might have buried or, you know, so it's um, perhaps not for the faint hearted if you're a very sensitive individual. Um, I mean, I have taken it myself and I felt... Um, and it even says as a warning on there you may feel flu-like symptoms you know because it's basically it's stirring toxins up so that yeah. since toxins are now in circulation um and um which is good because you want it getting rid of yeah um but in the process of doing so you have to just keep reminding yourself you're detoxing that's why you feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> emotionally as well as physically and then yeah. after you've done that kind of you know maybe a gentle tea tox with teas or even using things like um the milk thistle three times a day you know four times a day even liver cleanse. yeah and yeah. um and the teas what's nice about the teas is that it's um supportive for your kidneys because of course you're going to urinate out the tea mm -hmm. and, and that will just also help um because the kidneys are also the um, elimination organs you know just like um they're detoxifying organs in their own right um mm -hmm. um I think, you know, again, actually, you know, with sickle cell, I think um, detoxification is probably hu absolutely huge because your lungs are affected. And that's also actually a detoxification organ because you breathe, mm -hmm. you exhale toxins. So not only, you know, your liver is under a lot of extra strain, yeah. um, you know, your lungs, your kidneys, because kidneys, kidneys are often, you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, when you think about it in terms of sickle cell, it's like, oh my God, this is everything. I was like, what do you say? Um, and so, um, yeah, so uh, 
I think with you start neutrifying yourself with um, you know good foods and um, uh, take the nutrients, particularly A, C, and E, um, mm-hmm. for detoxing. Um, and you sort of once you've perhaps taken um, a course of those, maybe um, go on to yeah. detoxing like with nice herbal teas. Um, and if you want to go harder, you can take something stronger. Um, and the liquid extracts, you could take some of those for detoxing. Um, and I suppose even, you know, lymphatic support, because that's part of your immune system, but they, all the lymph vessels run alongside every single blood vessel and capillary. It's like its whole, it's like its own, you know, circulation system. And that also, but that picks also picks up a lot of toxins. So enhancing lymphatic flow. So even like lymphatic drainage massage <laughs> would be really great because it'll just yeah. help that system clear stuff. Yeah. Um, and then once you've done that, that sort of detox and you actually need to like re-nourish yourself at probably at the end, just with a bit more, just because you use nutrients to detoxify things. Uh-huh. <laughs> so again, you know, it's, you kind of have to support yourself quite a bit. And um, if you don't support yourself, I think you end up feeling very rotten and then you just sort of probably end up scrapping the whole detox and think, ah, I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes too hard basket. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you kind of want to um, see it through. Mm-hmm. so um yeah <laughs> I know with with massage therapy because like you said I, I'm, I'm a therapist a massage and holistic therapist so yeah um doing massage therapy and when my back was bad I know that having massage therapy I needed really deep tissue massage because my back was bad for months um yeah and there was only one person I could ask to massage me when I was at this stage and I made her sweat <laughs> she literally she had to work so hard my back felt like a rock solid oh, wall no. um when I went to the A&E um oh, department no. they said it's just your back it's just it's, it's probably just stress and and it was um and massage therapy for me was the best thing for it um yeah. as well as detoxing um but it would knock me for six so and and yeah. that a detox as well so I know in my detox process it, it knocks me out and I feel my head pounds the next day it does feel like mild yeah. flu symptoms yeah when I'm detoxing so yeah just everyone be aware it's it's not that you're going into crisis because th- there's even a similarity with crisis pains and flu type yeah. symptoms as well um for me anyway I find so yeah it's um it's good to know uh, another thing um yeah. you know with regards to electrolytes um oh yes because i know that cucumber um juice can be blended and, and made as a natural electrolyte um oh, yeah what can we blend with it to kind of use to replenish electrolytes in the body naturally i was thinking you know what celery celery springs to mind because that's fab that's got lots of um you know it's quite salty and yes. you know the funny thing, you know what you mentioned about drinking five liters of water a day. I know that yeah. that's obviously to prevent, um, you know, for prevention and for also helping you going through some the crisis or um, yeah. Um, but do, do you get that. much do you get much salt in your diet? Because this is another thing that like I've recently, you know, salt is actually quite crucial. And we're told, oh, you know, salt, salt, thing salt about, yeah, you know, hypertension, um, everything, but. Where there is salt, there is water. We were always taught that, you know. And so yeah. if you don't have salt in your body, you're just going to keep weighing that out instead of actually maybe holding on to it a bit. I don't know. Yeah, if- yeah. I, I'm making sure that I, I do have um, – I, I was juicing celery until my juicer broke. So oh. I was having at least um, a full packet of celery every day. Oh, wow. Um, and also um, drinking – it only makes a glass, so mum and I would have, like, oh, a slim – I, I don't even know the amount but a slim glass each of, of celery juice and that really does help and because like you said it's salty um mm-hmm. I, I know that that's really good and and then I knew that um lemon water for alkali- alkalization in the mornings um so I tend to have that with my ginger and lemon first oh, thing yeah. on an empty stomach and, and just try and kind of keep my system as as nourished as possible that way um but yeah, I, I've been mindful of like um, losing losing sodium, um, with, mm. you know, with flushing so much. But um, I find that that's the only time that my body sen- tends to, even breathing actually, the more I drink, the better my breathing seems to become. 
Um, so <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, and sometimes it's plain water and sometimes it's either lemon water or sometimes it's just, um, I have to dilute with a bit of squash and I know that all the additives in it are not great, but yeah. I just sometimes need a bit more flavor than just, just plain water or liquid chlorophyll I'll have. And that's oh. another good one. Yeah. Um, what about um, beetroot juice? Yeah. I, I tend to drink the teas, but oh, I haven't, okay. I need to buy a new juicer <laughs> and then start doing all my juicing again. Cause yeah. that's, it's really effective. It's really good. And on days, if I feel like um, Sydney, if ever I, I struggle like with eating, just juicing, because sometimes that's what your body's just telling you you need. And that will still get give you a bit of nourishment as well, won't it, Julia? Yeah, of course. And if yeah. you can add anything, like if you can tolerate nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's always nice to add in. And even okay. if you um, like oats to smoothies, because that's nourishing for your nervous system and um you know fiber for their gut microbes i mean the microbe thing could be a whole nother chat <laughs> yeah yeah you know, it was even um with bone um density there was something i came across the other day that there was um microbes um that you can take that support bone density you know and oh. this is great for menopausal people you know because or anyone with bone issues going on because um that's just crazy that all these gut microbes and that's why I sort of wondered, you know, if, I mean, I'm sure sickle cell, you end up taking lots of painkillers just by default because I mean, what else are you going to do, right? <laughs> like with the pain. <laughs> so, um, but these things are not good for your microbes and your gut lining and your liver. And, and it's just, but I mean, you do need to manage the pain, you know, obviously, but you can mitigate it by taking things like the glutamine and um, supporting the liver just to help, you know, um, and slippery elm, that's another one that's nice for the sort of lining of the stomach. If you're taking, you know, aspirin or, or any pharmaceutical really, um, but just don't take them together because it, 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 it stops the absorption because <laughs> it really does a nice thick coat, but it's so nice and um, so nice. It feeds the bacteria as well as the prebiotic. You could even add that actually in your, in your smoothie <laughs> that you have <laughs> as a, a little bit of extra, um, you know, sort of gelatinous stuff for your, your gut, because <laughs> that's what it loves. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so I'm going to try all of this. Thank you guys so much. Oh, I'm so pleased. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julia. It's been really great. Um, the information is just, even though I know we're having the slides, it's just, there's so much that I think I want to just try you know yeah. and keep trying because I think health is health is wealth it's it's everything um and if we don't have it it's it's life is pretty rubbish without it <laughs> so um yeah thank you so that's so okay. very much oh, that's all right <laughs> thank you um and feel free whenever you're ready to to pop out um I'll stay by now for when you're when you have to leave um, to, okay. to you, Julia, but feel free to just nip out whenever you're ready. Um, okay. And I'll email you these, you. these slides. Um, it, do you want it, what format do you want? Do you want it in a presentation, the PowerPoint, um, or do you want yeah, a PDF? PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint or PDF is great. Yeah. Whichever is easier for people to read or download or whatever. <laughs> yeah. E okay. Either is absolutely great. Okay. Um, but thank you for being here and thank you for making yourself available. Oh, that's okay. Today. That's I know right. that you, it's hectic. <laughs> well, it's a you. very hectic week. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm really pleased I could help. And <laughs> thanks for your time. Thank you, <laughs> well, we, we appreciate Thank oh. you. Okay. Take I'm going to, um, and, and you too, um, you don't have to go now. I'm not chasing you out. I just wanted you to know that um, just in case anyone else is speaking in the meantime, um, you, you're okay to leave at whichever point is, is okay. you have to go. Okay. But, um, I, I, we really appreciate you being here, um, all of us. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and um, uh, is it okay? Um, sorry, yeah. So yeah. with you, you, Julia, and what you do, um, you're available for consults? Or... Yeah. 
I do okay. do um, Zoom consults. So it was a whole pandemic thing. <laughs> we ended okay. up having to do, I think, even all the doctors and everyone's on Zoom now. Um, yeah. I'll, so I'll follow up with you and we'll connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, sure. On LinkedIn or um, I'm on Facebook and okay. I'm on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're actually in the group. I, I don't know if that's your business pages in the group, but um, but I can I can oh, yeah. I can send you the link, Carl. I can send the link to everyone in the group. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Am do. I okay? should I give your email address? I, I don't know. If yeah, that's, please do. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. It's on the first page of the presentation as well. If you tell me what it is now, I can put it in yeah. the chat just in case anyone wants. Do you want me to, to... type it in the in the chat? Oh yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, dot... Thank you so yeah. much. Oh god, my keyboard's all a bit funny. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, I'm going to. Sorry. Um. Actually, that's right. Okay. Perfect. I'll just put it in the chat. Oh great! Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. And I'm really pleased that Ginkgo is working well for you. <laughs> it really is. I find there's days sometimes I have been sleeping a bit or having trouble sleeping at night. So um, if, if I'm in pain, I'm, I'm going to try like making a ginger poultice if I've been in pain or my eye or my face has yeah. been swelling on the left side and my eyes have been really stabbing yeah. me. So um, just having, having, um, a really disrupted day and really disrupted sleep where I'm sleeping and it's all out of sync and then I'm sleeping a couple hours in the afternoon and, and that's been helping so I'm not necessarily taking three of the the dosage every day yeah. but I'm taking two at least and and I need to kind of be consistent with it and that's really hard at the moment but I'm trying <laughs> but it, it does help it does okay. help I, I can good. function oh <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> But thank you. You're, you're Hi, amazing. Anyways. Nice to see you again as well. <laughs> and you too. <laughs> um, and uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm oh, going to um, introduce Carl, our next speaker today, um, who is um, a sickle cell trait warrior. And he is all the way from, is it New York, Carl? It is. Yay. New York City. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited well. to to yeah. be here with you and um because you reached out at the next at the previous session and um yeah the flaws yours bro i'm excited <laughs> i'm gonna well, mute you. i, I want to say thank you to you first for putting this together i see the group uh, growing exponentially we have almost 500 members and i our our colleague uh farron dozier i've been following him around on some of the other sickle cell um the actual anemia sites which is you know certainly I, my heart always uh feels bad for them because they have it maybe worse than we do relatively speaking but i think that from our perspective being having the trait it was still needing a sense of belonging like you were kind of I'm in the groups but i'm still kind of an outsider because it's the trait it's not the actual disease and the perception is different you know doctors even talk to people um differently uh my own my, my doctor uh, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran a military veteran and i go to the veterans hospital and she's like she kind of downplayed it a little bit i wish i could have invited her on this session um but my journey with being introduced to having the trait started when I was about 13, like nothing happened before that time. I think that I was becoming more active as a teenager. You know, I ran track, was running on the track team in high school and involved in martial arts. And, you know, so my, and my mother was very baffled by this whole thing. Um, I started getting these chest pains, which the only relief would be to me going into the fetal position because my chest would just tighten up like somebody something was stabbing me all the time um i'm not i'm not sure i might be in the guinness bro book of world records for having the most ekgs because um, i think i had hundreds of them from the age of 13 into my 20s and there's even a running joke in my family my mother said you know i was a very sickly child i mean i never took any medications or anything unless i you know i was i had something that i needed to take for a sickness or something that was happening to me but nothing related 
but the, you know, even, even recently, one of my brothers said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm 64 now. And he's like, you know, you still got to watch what you're doing. You know, mom said you were sick. I was like, yeah, okay. But the irony is, is that I, the activity, not knowing what it was and going through these changes, my body was going through, just didn't know. And as it turned out, I joined the United States Marine Corps and I made my mother cry because she thought I was going to get worse. Oh, I shouldn't be going into that. And I went and life is a very strange way how things play out. This is 1979 for me. It turns out that the Navy is, the, the, the Navy actually runs a standard test for anyone that goes in the Marine Corps. Since 1968, they had started doing it, looking specifically for uh, recruits that were new people that were coming in for the looking for the trait for sickle cell or having the disease because they had instances where people were, you know, they dropped dead uh, from physical activity and they didn't know what it was. Now, not all of the military branches all do it. I think when Farron Dozier was telling his story when he was in the Air Force, they didn't do it back then. They actually only started doing it in 2019 and they, they only do it as a questionnaire. They ask people, <laughs> do you have it? Like, how would you know if you had it unless you were tested for it, you know? And, so when I found that out, I found out that I had to, I was excluded or disqualified. I couldn't jump out of an airplane with a parachute. I couldn't scuba dive and I couldn't be a member of an airplane crew. So that disqualified me from quite a few jobs with doing things. But at least I was grateful that I found out what it was that was I was going through all these years, you know, prior to, to doing that. Um, and so I, I still did my physical activities. You know, I, I found out through actually for me as a strange anomaly. One of the things that that I've seen just from the session that we had the last time in this session, everyone's symptoms or challenges are different. I don't think there's going to be any two people that have the same exact um, set of symptoms and, and how, how their body reacts to certain things as Julia mentioned before that it's different for everyone, you know, and things that they take inside, you know, into their body as well. And uh, I just wanted to kind of create a balance because I've always been a very active person, you know, I'm high energy with doing things. And you know, so I run, you know, I ran marathons during that time when I was in the Marine Corps. And then I did the silly thing. I smoked for 20 years. Um, and in 2012, I, I cut that out. But I what I've learned through this process of is, is to listen to your body as it does certain things or doesn't do certain things. But I think there's a, for me personally, when I'm active, you know, running, I like to run long distance, um, doing high intensity workouts. My body actually is fine, believe it or not. I don't have any issues. My chest doesn't tighten up. It's the rest periods. Like if I don't exercise for like a week or two, my chest starts to tighten up almost like a barometer to say, Hey, you know what? You need to do stuff. You've been, you've been lazy, <laughs> excuse me. And that's one of those things that, you know, kind of listening to your body. So I feel like these days when I'm, you know, last eight, eight years, I've been running marathons and half marathons. A half marathon is my sweet spot. It's only 13 miles. Um, but, but I find that it, it, it keeps me, my body balanced, with the episodes that I had with the with the tightening of my chest um, with doing things. And as long as I'm active, I'm usually fine. You know, like, like you've been juicing, you know, doing the smoothies as well. Uh, for, one thing I learned from the last session that we had uh, was a gentleman, he mentioned but there was a question about how to stay hydrated. And I've been eating celery like crazy um, since, since the last session, actually. <laughs> my wife's going, you're going through a lot of celery. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, like yourself too, I drink, you know, I'm probably good for a, a gallon and a half to two gallons of water because I feel constantly thirsty all the time. You know, when is enough enough? And I try to balance the salt intake too. I drink, uh, was it coconut water, which usually, um, especially when running these long distances, it, it puts the electrolytes back into the body a lot quicker. And I found that out the hard way too, as I was running long distance that just drinking plain water will quickly, um, create that cramping muscle cramping uh, if we don't because the salts have been have been taken out with doing stuff uh, 
here in the United States, Gatorade is, is a big drink in all the sports arenas across, you know, the, the entire country. And I never really liked it because it, it, it actually, when I drink it, it makes me thirsty. <laughs> so I, but I had, I had to learn to kind of, if I'm running it, that's what they're serving, mix it up with water and the Gatorade to kind of keep the electrolytes even in my body with doing so. And I, I think that I, you know, one of the, you know, talk about lessons learned in my journey, you know, trying to work through this and, um, looking at some being with some of the other groups and now especially anything I I can do to help out with our group here, you know, the, the you and the other leaders that may come along with doing thing. Education and research is important. You know, there's there's not a great amount of information that's known with people that have the disease and there's little to no information for people that have the trait. I even went to one of the top three specialists in the United States a few years back and he thought I had the disease, so he agreed to see me. And when I got there, he goes, you got the trait. What's the big deal? I says, the big deal is, is that I've had health challenges. Turns out he was a researcher. He wasn't actually a practicing physician, you know, which is fine. And we need people to, to do research. But he kind of downplayed the whole thing. I said, is there any, you know, things I need to look out for? Any nutritional things? He goes, no. Nah. He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, you'll be okay. I'm like... <laughs> I go, I, I beg to differ with you. I'm not questioning, you know, you, you, you're board certified and you got all your credentials. I said, but I know what I've been going through and it hasn't been easy. Um, and I just kind of left it at that. But I think that our group here is probably going to be more powerful in making, I'm just surprised. I watched the numbers increase that, you know, the, you know, because you've, and I think this came up in our last group session, like you feel alone, like you feel like you're the only person that's going through this. And when you see that there are other people that, that have, are in similar situations, um, that they, 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 they um, you know, Sydney mentioned a little while ago about how she, you know, she can eat and then she can't, you know, and you have those bursts of those, those, those things uh, happening to you, you know, but it, but it's, it's, it, it's impacting our body. This is what it comes down to. And like you just said, you know, nothing, Health is wealth in terms of, uh, of, of doing those kinds of things. But I think that the most important thing, the takeaway in terms of lessons learned, I just want to just leave it with everyone is that each of us has to listen to our body, you know, and try to translate what's going on into what is it that we need to do to, you know, make the pain less. I don't think it's ever going to go away in one way, shape, or form. Minimize the episodes in doing stuff. I'm sure that, you know, that nutrition is probably one of the probably the best equalizers and supplementing if you have the right supplements now that Julie shared that information in terms of the kinds of things that we can should be taking um, and just be cognizant of it you know you I, I think one of the things she had on her sheet was the apple cider vinegar with mother not just apple cider vinegar it makes the, all the difference in the world um, my wife had a, actually a lot of allergies and she started taking it um, but I, it's, from that process we've been taking it taking it as well that you're taking the right things at the right time but you but being consistent that I think that's what happens to us we we get comfortable something I know I do I get comfortable I'm like maybe I don't take my vitamin C I might miss a couple of days but I should be taking it more consistent I am I am I have a just just got a new phone and I've been setting up alarms to just remind me because I you know it makes it easier to have to remember things and just pops up on the screen to just say, you know, take your echinacea, take your vitamin C, you know, it's that kind of thing. Uh, although I, I uh, and Julie might know better, I understand that when it comes to like something like echinacea, you know, you, you can only take it for 10 to 11 days because then it does just the opposite of what, you know, we're supposed to do to your body. Then you have to, you know, wait a week or so and then start back up with it. Uh, but I just want to, you know, just leave it uh, with the fact that, you know, anything I can do to help serve the group and be there and provide support. Um, I have a very busy schedule. I run a, a successful technology and, and a leadership development company, and we help people start businesses actually in the United States. Those that we've helped a lot of people thrive through COVID because of people needing extra income with doing things. But I will make, I will make it my business to adjust my schedule however you need me to help out with doing stuff to, to be here to support the entire group thank you thank you so much Carl I, from from when you reached out and that those were your words the last time I just I, I could have cried because I think finding support I mean 
the group we are a family and for me my, my mom knows I have gone on I, I guess from a caring a carer's perspective she knows that whenever I'm going through stuff I just go on and on and on I just need to get out my emotions and I'm a bit emotional now because it's like you guys have been such a family to me and knowing what I'm going through and knowing the confusion, knowing the physical pain, knowing the cycle, it's it's just having you guys. And, and then Julia, I've tried your back flowers as well for anxiety whenever I have been really anxious and they really do help to calm me down and I just go quiet for a while. I'll reach out to the group and I'll just stay quiet for a while. And just having your your comforting words, Carl, just hearing that, you know, whatever you need, I'm, I'm here. And and Sydney and, and everyone that's been, you know, in the group and Pedro as well, you know, just it's it's amazing the support that we found. So anyone watching who needs us, um, you know, just reach out. We're here. Um, and thank you so much, Carl, for for sharing. Um, thank you for having me be able to share. <laughs> our pleasure. Thank you. Um, Sydney, I'm going to introduce you next. Um, and you are a sickle cell trait warrior also and where are you based i couldn't remember where you're based i am in the united states in the state of virginia welcome yay <laughs> yeah welcome feel free girl the floor's yours this okay i'm just gonna share my screen here and just let me know if you guys can see it okay awesome thank you guys so much for having me today um i want to go ahead and share my sickle cell trait journey with you guys all righty so i'm going to start with hemoglobin um, in case anybody doesn't know, hemoglobin is a protein in your red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to your organs um, and tissue. The normal hemoglobin levels for hemoglobin A should be between 95, and this is about approximate 95 to 85%. Um, hemoglobin F would be between 0.8 to 2%, and then your A2 levels would be between 1.5% and 3.5%. Um, hemoglobin S, which is the sickling of the red blood cells, is abnormal and usually ranges from 20% to 45% in those who have sickle cell trait. Normal blood would have 0% of these hemoglobin S or the sickling cells. Um, for myself, my hemoglobin A levels are at 55.9, my S level is at 40, and my hemoglobin A2 is elevated at 4.1. Overall, my actual hemoglobin for gallons per deciliter is 12.7, and that, that is actual normal range for women. Um, so these are the things that I have experienced since childhood. Before I got to high school, um, I had a lot of infections with strep throat, and strep throat was always followed by scarlet fever. Um, these were coming possibly maybe once a year, um, every year is very frequent. Um, the doctor told me that if I were to get strep throat again as a child, that they would have to take my tonsils. Um, I never got it again, so that was a good thing. Um, as a child, I wasn't very active. I wasn't doing much. I did do like recreational cheering for maybe like a year or two, um, but I wasn't that active in my younger years. Um, during high school, I was very athletic. I did competition cheering gymnastics and tumbling, and I ran indoor and outdoor track, and I was a sprinter for two years. Um, in high school is when I started to notice, I guess because I was older, some of the symptoms that I was having. So during practice or after practice, I had a lot of shortness of breath, which will be represented as SOB throughout this presentation, abdominal pains, and weakness. Um, running track and being a sprinter was a lot of, um, it was just a lot on my body. Um, there were times where I would just feel weak and get sick. I did have to end up stop running track in high school after my sophomore year um, because I just felt like I was always out of breath. I just couldn't breathe. My chest was hurting, um, even with cheering. I was always tired. It was hard for me to, you know, complete our warm-ups and run our laps. But at that time, I knew I had the trait, but I didn't know that the trait had any symptoms or anything like that. 
Um, while I was at home, especially at night, I had really, really bad leg pains from my hips all the way down to my ankles. I know my grandmother would sometimes try to give me medicine for arthritis. I can't remember if it worked or not, but I just know the pains were really, really bad. And it was coming from my bones instead of like a muscle ache. Um, by the time I got to college, um, this is where things really started to, I guess I can say get worse. Um, in college, I was in the band. I did go to a historically black college and university, Virginia State University, and I was the dance captain, which means that I was putting in a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra energy than most of the other girls. Um, some of the symptoms that I had, this was during 2013 to 2014, um, headaches, stomach aches. I had a fever at one time of over 102 degrees, night sweats, abdominal pains, and which calls painful breathing, um, you know, breathing through your diaphragm. And I had really bad back and leg aches. I ended up going to the doctor after maybe two days. Um, it actually started on a Sunday. We came back from New York. We performed at MetLife. And I started off having a headache, which went to a stomach ache. So I was taking a leave and Pepto-Bismol. By the time Monday came, I was getting worse. Um, and that's when the fever started to come and the body aches. So I contacted my mom and she was like, you know, I think you should go to the emergency room. I was like, I'll wait till tomorrow. Uh, when I got to the doctor, she told me that I had gastritis in the stomach and that the Pepto-Bismol was not gonna help it. She said that I had a UTI and based off of the information that I told her that I did over the weekend, she said everything was due to my sickle cell trait and that I was overexerting myself and I was not putting in enough water. That was the first time in my life that I can remember that somebody told me that anything that was going on health-wise was due to the trait. That was in maybe August or September of 2013. I probably had a UTI every two months after that for the rest of the year into 2014 school year. Um, I also ended up contacting, well, getting strep throat again. Um, I had a lot of weakness fatigue, shortness of breath, and chest pains. Um, after college, things just got worse as I got older. Um, in December of 2017, I called this my menstrual cycle emergency. I was on my way to work. I was a server at Texas Roadhouse, um, and I decided to go to Home Depot to use the bathroom before I went to work. Um, this was also the first day of my cycle. I stopped and got some leave. I took two a leave. My cramps were starting to get bad and I wanted to just be able to have a normal work day. I got to Home Depot, maybe five minutes into the bathroom. I had to contact my manager just to let them know I didn't feel well. I got worse and worse and worse. I was in full body sweat where I had to start taking my clothes off in a public bathroom. I was laying on the floor because the floor was cold and my body was hot. I was having really bad stomach pains. Um, I was nauseous. I was extremely nauseous. The sweat turned into chills. I was too scared and I thought that these are just cramps, they'll go away. Um, I called my manager again and I said, I'm just really, really sick. I'll get there as soon as I can. A lady came in the bathroom and I asked her to please get a manager. Um, the manager ended up calling my job and my manager came over and said that I was unresponsive under, on the bathroom floor in Home Depot. He had to crawl underneath the bathroom stall to unlock the door. And I kind of was up. I wasn't like passed out. By the time he picked me up, I just start throwing up everywhere. The ambulance came. They took me to the hospital, did blood work, gave me IVs and told me they have no clue what was wrong with me. That was in December of 2017. In December of 2018, I came home. Um, I was really sick. I was having abdominal pains. I was vomiting all day. I couldn't keep water down. Um, I had weight loss that I didn't notice. My family did, and I wasn't eating. When I got home, my mom called me and she said she was concerned. It looked like I lost a lot of weight, so she told me to go to the doctor. By the time 2019 came, I did go ahead and go to the doctor. He did blood work and urine work. I weighed 94 pounds at the time. Um, he came back and told me that my blood work and my urine was abnormal. They needed to send my blood work off to somebody. 
there were issues with my pancreas and my liver. The enzymes were off. Maybe they were too high. I can't remember. Um, I had valerium or something like that. I can't remember everything. Um, I think there was protein in the urine also that they found. Um, I was so sad. I was crying. I was scared. I didn't know what was going on. Again, I was 94 pounds at that time. That was the smallest that I can imagine myself being as an adult. Um, I was diagnosed in 2019 with abnormal weight loss, abnormal urine, abnormal blood work, loss of appetite, abdominal pains, vomiting, constipation, and I had many procedures such as an endoscopy, colonoscopy, a HIDA scan to see if my gallbladder was functioning correctly. They even did a scan or some type of test to see if my stomach was emptying correctly. I did not have gallstones. All tests came back fine. Um, they had no clue what was wrong with me and they just kept putting me on medication and said that I had acid reflux. Um, I also had chest pains to go along with all of that stuff on the medications. Um, in 2020, I felt fine from October. October was when I had my colonoscopy. From October 2019 until February 2020, I felt about fine. I was having lower abdominal pains at this point. So in 2019, it was more of central pain, but it wasn't hurting. It was very tender, um, tender to the touch. I just felt like I just needed to kind of like lean over. Um, so when I got to the abdominal pain in February of 2020 last year, it was lower abdominal pain. I went to the see my doctor. He told me to go to the emergency room because he thought that it was either going to be my appendix or I had a cyst on my ovary. I went to the ER. None of that was true. They said I was perfectly fine, but they did find a gallstone and they suggested that I have my gallbladder removed. Um, two days later, I was at work. I'm a high school teacher. I had the pains again at work where they had to come and get a wheelchair, take me to the nurse's office, and they ended up sending me home. I went back to the doctor. They did full ultrasound on my uterus and my pelvic and everything. Um, they did not find a cyst, but they said there was fluid. Um, so it could have possibly been a folic cyst that ruptured. Um, I still don't know if that is really what happened. That's just kind of the conclusion they came to. Um, and then in May 2020, I had my gallbladder removed. Um, from there, I felt, you know, fine. I felt normal up until 2021, which is my most recent. In February of 2021, one day I realized I had a headache. Um, the headache turned into abdominal pains again. I had very, very bad extreme diarrhea, which turned into leg pains, which are the leg pains I had in high school. So I was talking to my mom every now and then I would, you know, text her like, I'm having pain where my gallbladder used to be. She said, you know, sometimes that happens. Um, once the leg aches came back, I decided that I wanted to go see a sickle cell specialist. Doctors kept telling me nothing was wrong with me. Um, they told me it was in my head, it was stress, it was depression, it was anxiety, it was all this other stuff that was causing me to lose weight, not be able to eat. I went to finally go see a sickle cell specialist in Richmond, and he told me that I wasn't going crazy, um, everything that I was experiencing was real, and that people with the sickle cell trait can have symptoms, but it is very, very rare. Um, I also was experiencing back pains. After I had left the doctor, I had for the first time in my life experienced pain in the hip that caused me to limp, pain in my arms, pain in my shoulder that radiated from my neck and my back. Um, I am now taking L-glutamine, which they call Indari. And that is like a protein dietary supplement that I am taking for uh, my pain crisis. I'm not really sure how much it's helping. Um, I do kind of feel a difference, but I've only been taking it for about maybe a month now. So I'm just trying to see how that goes. Other symptoms that I have had throughout my life, cold weather causes me to have back pains. If it's too hot outside, um, my hands and my feet swell, especially my feet. Um, Hot weather also causes me to have shortness of breath. 
Um, since the pandemic, wearing a mask in hot weather is hard for me. It causes extreme shortness of breath. Um, hot weather also causes me to have headaches if I'm in the heat too long. And I've experienced back and neck pains that have led to headaches. So I have been seeing a chiropractor on and off. I stopped seeing my chiropractor in February when I started to go to my sickle cell specialist. Um, I do want to read a quick story for you guys. This is what sickle cell trait can do. And this is a trait crisis. Um, did you know that having sickle cell trait can cause you to go into a sickle cell crisis that requires you to be hospitalized for days? In the early 1990s, around 37 years old, a mother of two experienced her first sickle cell crisis. While completing daily housework, she started to feel as if her body was going out on her. So she went to an urgent care facility. There, her appearance was so concerning that the nurse immediately called for a doctor. The doctor had to help the mother because her body was too weak for her to walk. She was medi medicated and rushed to a hospital where the staff was already waiting for her. They kept her in a hospital for 14 days. And during that time, the doctor did inform her that she was in a sickle cell crisis. Again, this mother has the trait, but she was in a full sickle cell crisis. This was the first of two hospitalizations within six months for this sickle cell trait mom. During these hospitalizations, no blood or oxygen was given to the patient, but she did experience pneumonia. No organs or surgeries were done during these events. However, 13 years prior to this incident, she did have her gallbladder removed and her appendix removed without the permission of herself. So they took the gallbladder, which she knew, and then they also took her appendix out. Um, from what she can remember, this mother has had health issues all of her life. She has experienced issues with female reproduction, reproductive system and pregnancy issues, such as trouble getting pregnant, infections during pregnancy, complicated pregnancies, and a complicated first delivery that led to an emergency C-section. Throughout her life, she has also experienced intestinal colic, heart murmur, nosebleeds, migraines, which are no longer present, burning in the hands and arms, leg pains prior to menstrual strikle, cycles, which is how she knew her cycle was coming, dizziness, and fainting. She also shared that she has been to an urgent care before, and when she saw her blood, the doctors were extremely concerned. She was called to the back for further discussion and the doctors and nurses were telling her or trying to explain that something was wrong and they did not know what it was. Thankfully, the mother already was aware that she had sickle cell trait and informed the medical professionals of her condition. So basically the doctors were saying the blood looked weird and she asked if the, sh if the cells were like kind of curved or whatever and they confirmed that they were and that's when she let them know that she had the trait. Um, although this happened years ago, we as warriors still do not have the support or the research needed to fully understand the blood disorder and the effects that it can have on our bodies. This mother is a fighter and one of the reasons I have decided to really focus on bringing awareness to sickle cell. Through all of the complications with her first delivery, she was able to have another child eight years later with the trait that was also passed to that child. Although we do not share all of the same symptoms, I am glad to be here today to advocate and share our story. This person is my mom. Um, four things that my doctor informed me about people with sickle cell, um, exercise related injuries, people with sickle cell related um, exercise injury broadly include the complications of unexplained sudden death. Um, excuse me for pronouncing some of these words wrong. Exertional rhabdomyolysis and heart associated collapse, um, renal disease, which affects your kidneys, um, renal abnormal abnormalities are among the most common manifestations of sickle cell trait. The prevalence of hematuria, which is urine in the blood, and they can also test that for UTIs, has been noted at a higher rate among sickle cell carriers compared to those with normal hemoglobin. Of course, you know us with sickle cell trait have AS, normal hemoglobin, they have AA. And the urinary concentrating ability among individuals with sickle cell trait has been demonstrated to be associated in a dose dependent manner with sickle homoglobin percentages. Then we have two more symptoms, the venous thrombomy, hold on, thromboembolism. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, two studies have more conclusively demonstrated a moderately increased risk 
of BTE among individuals with sickle cell trait compared to controls with hemoglobin AA. Those are ones without trait. With both studies, interestingly finding that the high total VTE risk is almost entirely due to an increased risk of PE, which is pulmonary embolism, which is the blockage of pulmonary arteries in your lungs rather than deep vein thrombosis, which is also DVT. Last but not least is pregnancy issues. Um, asymptomatic, asymptomatic, I need to slow down. Sorry, you guys, I'm nervous. Um, bacteria has shown the most consistent associations with sickle cell trait in the literature. Although several small cohort studies have found an increased unadjusted prevalence of pregnancy complications such as miscarriage, preeclampsia, prematurity, low birth weight rate, and maternal infections. And these are just some things that I have found based off of sickle cell trait and those with sickle cell anemia. So did you guys know that complaints of bone, joint, and abdominal pains, which they call vaso-occlusive crisis, are the leading cause for sickle cell patients to go to the hospital? Most abdominal pain is misconstrued and those with sickle cell because the pains can mimic those of medical emergencies that can lead to diagnostic dilemmas. The prevalence rate range for sickle cell patients with complications of cholelithiasis, which is the formation of gallstones, is between 30% and 70%. Three out of four of those people will undergo gallbladder removal. Abdominal crisis can cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. A woman's menstrual cycle can cause pain crisis. UTIs are higher for women with sickle cell trait. A complication of sickle cell is epistasis, which is acute bleeding from the nostrils that occurs from the structure in the nose, which is basically a nosebleed. Patients in crisis who develop intestinal colic or rectal bleeding should be considered for ischemic injury of the colon, which is reduction of the blood flow to the colon. So basically anybody with any type of intestinal colic, um, us with sickle cell, we know that it can lead to blockages in our um, blood veins and our blood vessels and a lack of oxygen. So that can cause the intestinal colic. 61% um, of sickle cell anemia patients were found to have um, basically heart murmurs with 50% being severe. Due to the sickling and blockage of blood flow, hands and feet can swell. And then last but not least, and I know Julia talked about this in her presentation, carriers can take Indari, which is the L-glutamine. It's amino acid dietary supplement to help with pain crisis. There is another um, supplement that they give people with sickle cell disease, but you have to, at least in the United States, you have to actually have the disease for your insurance to cover that type of medication. Um, and that is basically everything for my story. Thank you guys for letting me share. I put my Facebook name up here, which is Sydney Alexandria. My email address is sidfreeman93 at yahoo.com. And I am a new sickle cell and sickle cell trait advocate here in Virginia, mostly in the Richmond and Virginia Beach areas. Thank you so much, Sydney. That was fantastic. Um, really, really informative as well. And wow, your mom's and your story. I can totally relate. I was looking at the list and I just thought, wow. Um, yeah, thank you so, so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, um, Winter Freeman, is that Tremond? No, that's my mom. She accidentally oh. got it. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi, mom. Thank you for um, thank you for fighting with us, um, and um, yeah, we appreciate you guys both joining and and supporting um, and yeah, just just raising your voices in unison with us. Um, okay, so our next guest, um, he isn't on the flyer, um, but he is amazing because he's agreed to come on at short notice um, just just last night actually. 
um, because we had a um, we had a cancellation. Uh, well, we had a, a unfortunate um, non attendance from Diane because of her news. So, um, Pedro, welcome. And you are a sickle cell trait warrior as well. So um, introduce where you're based. I can't remember where you said you're based. And um, welcome. And the floor is um, yours. I live in Winter Haven, Florida. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. That's why my background is the flag. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Oh, OK. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, and I, I feel like I've been dealt the easy hand. Like I'm hearing you guys, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I, I feel for you guys. Um, for me, I've only dealt with asthma, and like that affects me with being able to do jobs like a full time job. I cannot do it. Um, I've tried. And I've gotten sick because I can't do like a job that makes me work like without any breaks unless I have my lunch and that's it. I can't do jobs like that. So that's my my struggle. Um, but I haven't really been like affected by my sickle cell trait as much. It's more because of another condition that I have that it's called hydrocephalus where you gain too much spinal fluid and so that affects um, your ability to stay in the heat um, for some people they have trouble sleeping um, and also vision so I mostly joined this group because I wanted to learn like what other people's lives are with sickle cell trait. I thought mostly the, the disease was the problem, not the trait. So I, I'm I'm just like shocked. Like I did not expect to like hear so many different things affecting people with just the trait. Um, but for the most part like when it comes to the trait I don't really have much to say. I think just just knowing that you know that the seeing the differences between all of us how we all are different like like Sydney you said like Carl you said as well everybody's body is different for me I, I'm similar to Carl where I used to run I used to train but as a child I was very very sick um I didn't realize the the link between you know how exercise can trigger a crisis as well um I didn't really look into that. My mom just believed the doctors because she's old school in Zambia. She came from Zambia years ago. And, and to be honest, I believe she has the trait, but we've never checked. And now she's older. She doesn't want to check. She's old school. I know I have it. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't need to really know where it came from, but I was always really active. And then I would be extremely thirsty. Um, and it's only last year when I began drinking up to five liters, so over a gallon and a, and a bit of water, that I even began to think, I'm, I started thinking I was turning diabetic. I was thinking, oh my gosh, am I turning, you know, am I, am I diabetic? And I panicked because I was like, why am I drinking so much? I always drank like well over two liters, but never over four. And so it was like, this is every day, I'm so thirsty. Um, so seeing like the differences across the spectrum, um, it just it just is it's interesting to know. But I think also to have that you know that that it's okay to be different. It's okay to have sickle cell trait and feel okay or not as bad as someone some of us who who have the extreme crises. Um, and it's 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 just great having this platform to have everyone sharing awareness, you know, sharing their stories. And this is this is what's needed a, a place for us to voice how we feel without judgment, you know, without being told, oh, it's in your head or you're crazy or it can't happen. And oh, and another one that I've heard many times and and is is a 
a myth because it's like, well, I never knew that white people could have the trait. That was something that was new to me. Um, and it was like, well, you know, it was a black thing and coming from Africa, it was like everybody just believed it was a black thing. And so, and, and knowing, you know, there's so many of us, all different ethnic backgrounds and it's like, well, here we go. Here's the evidence, you know, and, and this is what is needed to keep these convos going, to keep us sharing our stories, to keep us, I guess, keeping each other sane, because I think it's a wonder we're not crazy by now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I'm so grateful to you guys, beyond grateful to you all for being here. Um, and yeah, the floor's open. I think one of the most important guys. things was what Sydney said earlier in her presentation about, you know, being adamant to tell people, the doctors, yes, they're medical professionals and they have trained for a while, but yeah. they're out of their realm with doing stuff and people need to stand their ground with telling uh, people, especially letting them, even in Pedro's case too, that maybe you don't have major symptoms, but being knowledgeable and being aware when you go and see your doctors or your health professionals, that yeah. you still let them know because because we're it's constantly going to be an issue of being, things being misdiagnosed. They call mm -hmm. the diseases the chameleon disease because it's misdiagnosed all the time for other things. Yeah. And it has to do with familiarity or what doctors know about or what they're trained to know not yeah. you know and at least in her instance with the, the story about her mom there that they, that that they at least took time to do a little bit more research they went the extra mile for doing stuff you know and uh the other thing too you know i'm, I'm one of those I, what I call, you know, I'm in the beige group, I'm multiracial, my mother's from Puerto Rico, my father's from Barbados, so, you know, it's, and in the United States of all places there, that whole thing about uh, it being associated with, with, with a certain culture group of people, that went away years ago, because the United States, we, we, we're full of multiracial people, there's a lot of, you know, yeah. bloods over the decades of doing things, so that, that whole thing, you can't, nobody can believe that at all, not to mm -hmm. say it was even true to begin with. <laughs> yeah. I, I do want to say um, one thing that, like, um, that, like, I'm in a different group from my condition of hydrocephalus. It, even in that group, we all have the same condition, but are affected differently. Mm -hmm. There's people that have had, but they're the same age as me in their 20s, and they've had three times as many surgeries as me. So, like, every... It's, I don't know, like, everybody could probably be in, in the same box of having single cell trait or like me, hydrocephalus, mm. it, totally different stories. And Sydney, like, I used to be, I used to think it, it was just with, like, Hispanics and African Americans, cause that's, like, what I knew, mostly, because even with, like, what I learned in school, that the Caribbean and Africa, that was where most of the diseases came from. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised to even hear anyone that like isn't in that group that has it. So that was new to me. Yeah, I think I definitely relate because everyone that I'd seen growing up was black um, and it was just like, okay, you know, it's a black thing. And that, that was the stigma and the stereotype that I knew. So it was, you know, just, okay, it's, it's inherited and it's a mainly an African thing. And that's, that's literally or a black thing, you know, Africa Caribbeans over here in the UK, it was Afro Caribbeans and Africans that mainly had it. And that's all you saw. That's all you see represented um, a lot of times as well. And now it's like, well, actually, no, it's very diverse, but people just, I think a lot of times people are just quiet and I think that stems down to stigmas, um, stigmas in cultures. I know with my background, um, the, the Zambian culture is shh, keep quiet about everything, everything you go through. It's, you know, and, and I guess also coming from the old school generation, my mom comes from, she's 73, she had me at 37. So her, her, um, generation where any problems keep quiet you kind of keep it within you don't really advertise it and so for me it's a new thing kind of being so open but it's so relieving it's done so much for my mental state because having the platform is empowering to actually share your story and know that actually 
it's not just you because how many people have reached out and and spoken you know about it now and that we're getting something going something's going everybody's talking about it and it's important because like sydney's presentation said and we all know you know sudden death and and also pedro it doesn't mean that just because you might be asymptomatic but anything can trigger a crisis there's conditions that can so just being aware making sure that your your healthcare practitioners when you go to them they're aware of what you're you're dealing with because it's invisible as we all know, it's invisible unless someone really knows you. Um, I was talking to um, a, a full-blown sickle cell warrior the other day, and I said to her, people say to you, oh, but you look fine. But a lot of times people might look at you and not see the color of your skin. I mean, I'm a light-skinned black girl, you know, so my skin's really pale. But when, and, and I've noticed that looking back, I may not go jaundiced as the usual, you know, jaundiced eyes or whatever, but my skin, turns almost like a really pale ghastly white and almost yellowish and my mom's noticed that through the years however I look back at photos and my pictures when I'm sick my face is a different color to my to my skin it's really pale and the rest of my body's darker it's like wow okay that's crazy <laughs> you know and and it's only through looking back this past year, go, going through the worst that I've ever had. I mean, all my crises were bad. And every single time they come on, they're, they're quite bad. Um, but just looking back and in hindsight, reflecting that that reflecting period has been necessary to kind of get to this stage where I've had enough. You know, I need to take control of this. I need to fight back. Um, and so just, just having this, having you guys reach out, having you guys willing to share, it's like, I just, I, I can't every single time, you know, I hear from you guys or someone shares their story, it's like, wow, you know, I, I need this because it does something inside me, especially on the days where you feel like, or where I feel like, I don't know how I'm gonna get back up. I don't know how I'm gonna fight. I don't know how I can continue. It's just hearing one person tell their story that kind of just makes all the difference. And it's like, okay, I got this, I got this. I've got to keep getting back up and it's, it's, it's amazing. And one day Carl, like you and your training, you inspire me. I want to get back to running again. I want to get back to where my lungs can breathe and take in oxygen and, and expel all the toxins and the CO2. And I just, you know, I want to be able to do that again. So. You know, just hearing this, it's, I believe it's, it's, it's going to help me find a safe way to actually get back to that place. Um, that so you guys are amazing. Step, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. hey, um, again, I want to address, and I'm sorry that I'm talking about a different medical condition, but it's just, there's some similarities here. Um, like, I have a friend that his hydrocephalus he was good until he turned 12 and they um he lived in dr and until he moved to the states his parents didn't even know that he had it and um when he turned 15 the spinal fluid got into his eyes wow. and he was blind and i have met so many more people with the condition and he is yet still the only person that I've met with that's blind mm -hmm. because of hydrocephalus. Wow. Mm. So it's just like with sickle cell. Like, yeah. I, I, there could be a million people and a million different side effects because of it. Mm -hmm. And another thing, Pedro, um, a lot of us share our hemoglobin levels and they're so different. Um, between our A2s and our hemoglobin S, some people have 35, but some people have 45. Some people may have A2 at 2.5 and some may have 4.5 and it's so drastic. Some people are, um, even with the anemia, don't have that bad of a crisis. And then you have people with the trait that are getting so sick that they have to stay in the hospital. It's just it's so much, it's so much research that I think that needs to be done, um, more trials. Um, I really would wish that they, it feels like they gave up on sickle cell trait. They said a long time ago, it's asymptomatic and they left it at that. 
and they just kind of stick with it. No matter how many times people go to the doctor, um, you know, just thinking of all these different symptoms that we have. And it's very rare that the doctor says, oh, that's from your sickle cell. That is very rare that that is what we hear. Yeah. For me, um, I had to move from Puerto Rico because doctors over there did not want to address my hydrocephalus. And they were like, oh, no, he'll, he'll grow out of it. He'll grow out of it. If I would have stayed in Puerto Rico, I would either be blind, brain dead, or completely dead. So I like from I think like even for you guys, you guys with sickle cell, it's more of we got to be our own. Oh, we got to be proactive. Like yeah, we got to demand that we get the care that we need. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask you guys is I've drafted a letter together um, from the group and um, what I wanted to do was to circulate it to everyone who attends and also um, to the previous panel as well and just it's it's for us because it's Global Voices United I want it to be where we all can use that and also um, we can send it as an email and send it along to our um, healthcare professionals and send the recordings as well and say that, you know, this is a list of evidence. It's kind of like, kind of like a petition. It's saying, this is what we are going through. We want you to listen. And it's basically demanding attention. It's saying, you know, we're here telling you our story. There's all of us. And this is what the aim I hope for these, these presentations, these panel discussions where we can share, you know, our journeys and our stories um, on video and say, this is what we're bringing to you. You guys are telling me, no, nothing's wrong. Or, you know, in that case, I would love to be able to say, okay, well, here we go, but I need names. Um, that's what I would like to do is to, I'll, I'll forward on the letter. I need to actually just update it. But um, if I do that this coming week, I'm not gonna stay today just because I think after today, I'm gonna just take a bit of a chill, um, chilled afternoon. And then I'll, I'll type up the amendment inside it and then um, forward it to, to everyone who's attended as a panelist and just um, see whether you guys are okay for me to add your names and where you're based in the world. And that way, at least we can have a representation of all of us, no matter where we come from. And I guess when the numbers start growing in each different you know city or each different location, we can then look at kind of, kind of, I guess, branching or having people that are in charge of doing, um, you know, American-based and UK-based. But I think if we all work together as a collective um, and have this is us, this is what we bring to you. These are the links to our to our recordings. This is our story, hear us, you know, and I, I'm hoping um, to have it at least in the next month or two, to have at least enough names on there to then present to some of the medical boards over here and say, this is what we have done together, you know, and this is this is the aim we need, this things to change. You need to start listening to us when we say we're in crisis or, um, uh, you know how sometimes our labs don't necessarily show that we're in a crisis state or, or it's a pre-crisis or we're in pain. Um, and then that's, that's my story a lot of times is because my labs don't show anything's wrong, I end up being extremely sick and I seem to know my body's telling me, oh, something's wrong. I seem to know and then I end up really, really sick. And so that's, that's the thing that I always feel is that's the danger zone because anything can happen between me telling you, you sending me home and then I end up in hospital again. Um, and this time it's, I'm either fighting for my life. So, you know, it's, it's just that, that um, I guess that, that frustrating stage to stay, to stay cool, to stay calm, to know how to protect ourselves. Um, and yeah, and, and just to keep warring this battle together because we're strong together we're strong you know global voices united wow guys like carl you said almost 500 people it was just me confused last year and now i have you guys and it's like wow we have each other um but i think it's becoming exponential because i joined about a month ago and it was three something you know i think it's like 
it's it seems to be you know that, that there's some demonstrative to be said about that you know by part of the letter should have the link to the group so they can see that there's some there's something to this yes you're not, you're not making stuff up <laughs> yeah exactly i think that's what i'll that's definitely what i'll do is add the link to that um please forgive me if it isn't tomorrow but i will get it out to you guys um over the coming week um and I'm kind of a bit worried that we're going to cut off in case we do at 22. I think I have changed the times. However, I'm not 100% sure. And I'm sorry if it does cut off while we're speaking. I think I changed the time of the, of the discussion till four o'clock. So at least it allowed for additional time. But um, I don't know if I have. So if it cuts off, I'm sorry, guys. But um. I want to continue talking to you guys because this is great. It's just, you know, it's it's amazing. And I'm I'm grateful for you joining um, me here today. And especially at such early times, your times. Um, it's just beyond amazing. Thank you for being so strong. Thank you for fighting, you know, and thank you for standing together and, and raising your voices because they're valid. They're so important. Um, and this is us it's you know this is this is us we're gonna fight we're gonna make a change i truly believe that and i guess i never believed writing a book or i could write a book during going through and that's one thing i kind of want to do is is just let whoever's going through whatever they're going through know that regardless of i guess if you have determination i don't know if you guys listened to um dr david's presentation that time where he said and he has full-blown sickle cell anemia and he said sickle cell warriors are strong we have to be number one um we have no choice we have to keep getting up and fighting but because it can affect everything where where blood flows i mean blood is life where there's life flowing it can affect so literally and, and in my case I've had in many cases you know we've heard stories of each other going through so much um but we are stubborn I think as sickle cell trait warriors sickle cell warriors are strong in in its whole you know spectrum however I think as sickle cell trait warriors there's a strength that's undeniable because we're constantly being told there's nothing wrong with you <laughs> so um I just think, you know, we have to be extra resilient and extra, extra strong. And just having, I think this is just me appreciating the, the group because it's like this whole time I was going through so much alone and then meeting you guys and having that support, that's what helped me to write down my experiences. I just thought, no, I've had enough. I was asking people to go live with me on Facebook and people were, I guess, a Afraid. And, and I understand that 100% because I felt so scared for so long. And you know that the, the thoughts when you kind of think, what will so-and-so think of me? And I've never really been the kind of person to let people see me vulnerable. Um, I just pretend like everything's fine and everyone would see the smile on my face and they think I'm fine. And, and a lot of times they look to they look to look, but they don't look to see, if that makes sense. They don't look to really see that something's going on um, or you you cancel stuff and it's like, well, you've canceled again or there she goes. And, you know, so people kind of drop you off their friends list or friends invites for events and stuff. And it's like a lot of times it's been lonely, but I don't care about that now. I have, you know, this is my purpose. It's, you know, the purpose is to, make a change, make a difference. And that's what we're doing with these groups. I really, I just, I, I can't celebrate you guys enough. Um, okay, um, Carl, um, thank you so much, bro, thank for being you, here. Man. We'll talk thank again you. soon, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. There's one thing that you said um, where like all my life I've been like in school, because my because of hydrocephalus, my head was expanded because they were they had to make space for the extra spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I was always called Jimmy Neutron, Frankenstein, a whole bunch of stuff. Wow. It took me from third grade all the way up to my sophomore year to just let it go in from one year and not the other. Yeah. And 
for me, like, with my experiences, <laughs> most of my friends, my closest friends, are people with other um, conditions. Like, mm-hmm. I have a close friend that is in a wheelchair. That we, we're like brothers. And my other friend that he's blind because of hydrocephalus. And I never thought I would learn from someone younger than me. And this is a guy that, even with the fact that he lost his vision, he sees everything in, like, like a philosopher, in a way. Like, every discussion that I have with him, is like, he enlightens me almost every conversation that I have with him. Like, he's, like, the happiest dude you could ever think. Um, and I think it, it attributes to the fact that his parents are always, like, his parents also, like, brought me into their family, like, if I was his brother. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I guess what I want to say is that if we unite together as a group, we can accomplish anything. Like, oh, yeah. We can support each other and, like, let each other know it's not the end of the world. You can get through this. Yeah. I think that's what will help everybody just take it easy a little bit. Mm-hmm. Even if tomorrow you wake up with a struggle, so we, you've done it before, you can get through this. Just mm-hmm. hold on. You got this. Yes. Yeah. And we're located, I know when I watched the first um, panelist video that you did, and I was looking at where people were located and I was telling my mom, I said, there were people from Canada, from the East Coast to the West yeah. Coast, Australia, yeah. the UK. It was like all Africa. Over. <laughs> Africa, yeah. yes. And it's just, you know, there are people from all over the world that are going mm-hmm. through the same thing. It's yeah. not just like, um, it's in this country or on this continent. This is kind of like worldwide for us. Yes. And this was introduced in the early 1900s. I think I read about um, Mm -hmm. the first sickle cell sighting and that's over a hundred years ago and we're still going through the same thing we're still going through the same thing and if we can just come together to try to you know fight for a cause and it's hard Mm -hmm. like you say you know friends dropping you off it's hard to even explain to people when you don't feel good it's it's I just don't feel good it's nothing to say I know I don't look sick I know I don't have a fever I know I'm not always vomiting or you know but we have those internal pains that just sometimes you you just may be sitting down and you're making a face yeah Yeah. you're just like my stomach hurts and I know for me I'm um I'm a high school teacher Mm -hmm. it's hard to take off of work when I don't feel well I I was Mm -hmm. out of work for three weeks one time um you know when I got sick that first time in 2019 because I didn't know what was going on. I was on all these medications mm-hmm. and you can't even heal properly properly, or try to just focus on your health when you have yeah. so much other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. So there's just, you know, even if they had something in the health system for us people with the, the trait, they don't have anything that can exactly. protect us. Mm-hmm. So just anything would be helpful at this point. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. Like you said, Sydney, that you're a teacher? I am a teacher. I'm a high school teacher. I have a friend in my other group that she's an elementary school teacher. And one of the things that I applaud her is that with hydrocephalus, we are very keen to the smallest bit of noise. Mm-hmm. And she works with elementary school kids. I, I, I don't know how you guys do it with teachers struggling with a medical condition like this it's hard but we get through (laughs) it's that stubbornness it's that stubbornness and that resilience and that strength and you know you're determined I guess um like Dr. David Oweya said he said that you know I mean he's a medical doctor and through med school going through crisis I just think wow and being a teacher the studying the amount of noise the the late nights the you know the the marking lesson plans and then managing your health as well that's that's deep it's it's a big deal you know but like he said he said sickle cell warriors have an incredible amount of strength and that's what we are you know so it's just like wow you know we are strong we're so strong (laughs) 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, guys. I don't. I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to ask. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I, I, I'm beginning to feel a bit lightheaded. So um, I think my body's telling me to go and rest. But um, I, I'm so grateful to you guys for being here. Um, thank you. Please add thank anything. You. Just take um, care of yourself. The best I thing guess. is one's health. I will. And Thank and you, you guys all. too. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody that is here, um, yes. that attended to listen to our stories. We really appreciate it. We do. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending and watching and, and supporting us. You know, that support, we couldn't do it without you guys as well, watching and supporting all our allies, all our carers, um, and all, all warriors, all sickle cell trait and sickle cell warriors. Um, worldwide you know we appreciate and applaud you guys thank you dr austin we love you too <laughs> um thank you and i'll i'll definitely get that letter um drafted and, and amended and sent over to you guys via email this week let me know what you think and um yeah um i don't know if you've seen the chat sydney um from samantha Oh, yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to yeah. reach out to yeah. her. Thank you. Perfect. So yeah, I think from, I guess I I'd, I'd timed it in good time till four o'clock, but I think, I think you guys don't mind if, if we say bye for now and then we can always That's make fun. a part two or part three or part four and, and come back. Cause I think these sessions are great and, and I'll plan another one ahead. So, um, yeah i'll keep you guys posted and and feel free if you guys want to host any or let me know when you want to have a session let me know and we'll we'll do that yeah like my other group we thank do you it, um, we you're do welcome weekly sessions every saturday um like after dinner time okay like around eight eastern so it's it's amazing like i love wow. it so i think we we could do it in this group yeah I mean, I think I, I might not manage every week at the moment, just with how inconsistent I've been. But yeah, we can we can definitely um, make like a room, a Facebook room as well, and do like live Facebook check-ins and have groups yeah. where we can, you know, whoever's available can do that, and and we can you know connect with each other more because I think that's what we need. We need that support, especially. Um, going through and even if I'm laying on the sofa I can always say guys I'm here <laughs> you know that would be good that's a great yeah. idea thank nice. you guys I love thank you, you guys take oh, care guys. feel better make sure you get some rest I will and you too stay strong stay beautiful stay blessed and um yeah we're here in this together i really do appreciate and love you guys honestly you have become my family thank you sydney thank you pedro um thank you everyone who has joined and and attended and watching with us phyllis samantha sean dr tamia thank you we appreciate you guys and um yeah see you at the next the next panelist session Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye.